As a premier community in Hampton Roads, James City County strives to maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here's tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. I'll call this meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors to order for the purpose of regular meeting. Mr. Stevens, please call the roll. Uh, Mr. Hippel? Here. Mr. Hippel represents the Powhatan District and is Vice Chair to the Board. Ms. Sadler? Here. Ms. Sadler represents the Stonehouse District. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Larson represents the Berkeley District. Mr. McGlennon? Here. Mr. McGlennon represents the Roberts District. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Eisenhower represents the Jamestown District and is Chair to the Board. Sitting to my left is Adam Kinsman, County Attorney, and I'm Scott Stevens, County Administrator, and it's my pleasure to be Clerk to the Board. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, we will start our moment, uh, our meeting with a moment of silence here in a moment, and uh, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. And our pledge leader will be uh, Wyatt Sylvester, a fifth grade student at Laurel Lane Elementary, and a resident of the Berkeley District. So, Ms. Larson, if you would do the introduction. Yes, thank you. As you said, our pledge tonight will be led by Wyatt. Wyatt is a fifth grade student at Laurel Lane, and his principal came out this evening. Thank you, Ms. Swan. Uh, his interests inclu include music, sports, and fishing. He enjoys playing soccer, basketball, and swimming. Uh, Wyatt participates in the rec soccer program through the county. He is the student body president of Laurel Lane Elementary, and he is the son of Susie and Rich Sylvester. So thank you very much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Wyatt, if you'll come up, have this. Next on our agenda are presentations, and our first presentation is Neighborhood Speed Awareness Signs in Recognition of Alistair Smith. Mr. McLennan will do the honors. Yes, Mr. Chairman, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to go down to the podium sure. here. And I'd ask uh, Alistair Smith to join me up here. Right here for a second, Alistair. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, you probably recognize Alistair. He was with us a while ago doing the pledge, just like we saw a young men do the pledge this, this evening. Uh, and shortly after that, uh, Alistair and I ran into each other in the grocery store. And he said, you know, in my neighborhood, the cars are going awfully fast these days, and kids are trying to play in the roads, and, and uh, you know, it could be really dangerous for them. Um, and so I said, well, let's see what we can do. He said, you know, I see all these watch for children signs in some neighborhoods, and we don't have one in ours. 
So I said, well, I'll see if we can do uh, about getting one, one for your neighborhood. It lives on Indian Circle, a place that uh, Ed Oyer, uh, one of our frequent contributors to uh, former meetings, uh, uh, resides on as well. So Alistair um, uh, said, that would be a good idea to go ahead and get that. And I started researching it and went to our dedicated staff and, and said, well, how about uh, seeing if we can get one of these signs up in uh, this neighborhood? And uh, our staff said, well, we don't really do that anymore. And part of the reason we don't do it is because BDOT doesn't like the signs. Uh, and uh, uh, they don't like the signs because they did some research. And he pointed me to a, a manual uh, that was about 40 pages long explaining why it was that these Watch for Children signs that go up on, on some street signs in many neighborhoods just kind of fade into the background. And so most people don't even recognize that they're there and at the same time uh, give a false sense of security to parents and children who, who might be uh, nearby the road uh, when cars are going fairly quickly. So uh, based on what Alistair was asking uh, us to do, I went and did a little research on the internet and found that in fact uh, one of our other jurisdictions here in the Commonwealth, Fairfax County, several years ago started a program uh, which was designed to kind of remind people on a, an occasional basis that this is an important issue. All of which is to say that because of Alistair's question and because of his persistence in saying, you know, we really need to do something here so that the kids in our neighborhoods are safe, um, we are going to uh, have a new program going on in the county uh, where a series of, of yard signs will be made available for short periods of time, a week to 10 days, for a neighborhood to post up. Let folks be reminded of the fact that they need to be safe driving in those neighborhoods and take care for children. And uh, while, while they're doing that, uh, uh, then uh, hopefully it'll make uh, the neighborhood a little bit safer, meet Alistair's objections here. And here you can see that we have a number of these signs that will go up in yards around the neighborhood that send a variety of messages, not just one sign that's going to fade in the background, but a new message every few yards that will let people know that uh, this is an important concern. We've got a couple of sets of these signs now, and our county police department, our planning department, have been partnering in this uh, so that uh, we can have this uh, program available to neighborhoods to provide uh, this kind of uh, messaging. And so, Alistair, I, I want to congratulate you for your raising this issue and getting us to think about a different way of sending a very important message. And I, did you want to say anything about your decision to? move ahead with this? No. <laughs> well, let me just, let me just say that uh, uh, he's here tonight with his parents, uh, Michael and Rebecca Smith, and his sister, Sydney Smith. And uh, we are very proud to say that uh, uh, you have made a real difference, uh, Alistair. And here's a, significant, a certificate of recognition for you uh, for, as it says here, uh, for your role in making our neighborhoods safer for children at play. So that's your, and this is your, and I think Indian Circle ought to get the first uh, round of, uh, of these signs, uh, but then after that, uh, the uh, planning department, uh, 253-6671, will be responsible for distributing uh, the signs as neighborhoods request them for the opportunity to remind folks to take care in the neighborhood. So thank you very much. I don't know. program? Mr. McGlennon going to answer? Or, um, <laughs> uh, my, 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 I, I'm, I'm wondering Major. how much this, the, the group of signs are and how many we plan to have. And because this is a hot topic right now on the First Colony um, Facebook page, because we had someone that sped, I have to give police um, a great deal of credit from James City County. They've been working with our neighborhood, but it's a continuous problem, and it is a dangerous one. And somebody told me today, because I wrote that I often yell and say, slow down, and somebody said, well, that's, you can, that's libel. And, um, or maybe not libel, I'm sorry, that's wrong. But um, you shouldn't do that. And, but there's kids around me, and it scares me um, that, that are playing. So I wondered how many we plan to have, how many neighborhoods can we get these out to? Yeah, so the, 
aside from Dr. McLennan working with us on these signs, uh, the county uh, police department administration get a lot of questions from neighborhoods about speeding. Uh, so what we do is we try to work together, right? We'll bring VDOT out, uh, uh, the police department, and we'll work with these HOAs, but we weren't really able to provide a lot of takeaways, uh, right? Dr. McLennan said, because we don't put up this permanent signage. Uh, so we have these temporary signs that we're now able to take to a number of different neighborhoods. And uh, as he said, they're going to be on private property. So your neighbors are going to be the ones that are going to be displaying these signs. So uh, we still want to come out and meet with the neighborhood, talk about some of the things that, that the neighborhood can do uh, to encourage safe travel speeds. So these will be available to all neighborhoods. The idea would be that they'd only be up for a couple days at a time. So we'll really be able to rotate between the different uh, the different locations in the county where uh, they might be experiencing some of these issues. Uh, so it's not necessarily about the number we have overall. I think we really do want to just sort of see them rotated and replace as necessary and have a couple different sets so we can take them out to uh, some different places at the same time. Uh, Sergeant Johnson uh, heads up a lot of these meetings, so uh, he's, he's a good resource to have. Uh, and this really just gives him another tool in his belt to be able to work with these folks and uh, hopefully see some positive change. And there is, uh, Supervisor McGlennon did, did refer back to it, there is a traffic calming um, booklet that you can get from VDOT that um, Mr. Carroll has sent that I have sent to our HOA and, and we, can, we can forward it to other HOAs. But, you know, I, I will point to myself. Sometimes I catch myself going, our, our speed limit's 25. Sometimes I'll catch myself, it's a straightaway. I'm, it's, I'm going 30, I have to back it down. So we have to self-police ourselves too, but it is a real problem, and especially with distracted driving added into it. So I really appreciate, I'm glad that young man approached you in the grocery store. I appreciate everything James, James City's been trying to work the police, I know, with the neighborhoods, but it is a real problem. And it, it seems like sometimes people don't take things seriously until somebody gets killed. And I would hate to see anybody get killed in a neighborhood from speeding. So thank you. OK, thank you. Our next presentation is James City County Parks and Recreation State Awards, the Virginia Recreation and Park Society. Uh, Arlena Fauntleroy will be doing it. And I'm going to come down and spade down there myself. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman, Board of Supervisor members, Mr. Stephen and Mr. Kinsman. Um, and it's my distinct honor and pleasure to be here with you this evening to share the latest accomplishments of our Parks and Recreation team. Judged by a select panel and jury of their peers, our department won top honors in four award categories at the 2019 Virginia Recreation and Park Society Awards uh, ceremony. Uh, there was 115 applications that were submitted by various parks and recreation departments in 14 different categories. And this ceremony recognized excellence for the 2018 calendar year. So I will now introduce you to the outstanding staff responsible for these outstanding achievements. The first one. <laughs> he was busy writing down who was getting the signs. No worries. Sorry. <laughs> the uh, longest day. <laughs> yes. The first one is best new program um, for Project 547, which was James City County's longest day of play. Uh, this program received top honors based on its innovative and creative program design, effectiveness, efficient use of resources, meeting the needs of James City County residents, and overall excellence. This initiative was led by program coordinator Sarah O'Reilly and Christopher McKnight with support of all program coordinators. Um, here this evening, in addition to Sarah and Christopher, Mark Aker, Joy Johnson, and Kristen Tolch, and I'll ask them to come up. Um, Project 547 um, motivated citizens to get out and play all day long. Um, this team of folks created 15 um, free structured activities on top of the countless activities that we already had going on throughout that day. And the neat part about the initiative is most of the people that participated um, said that they had tried an activity for the first time. 
Um, picture, you'll see there was pickleball, there were nature hikes, there was uh, sunrise paddles, there was sunrise yoga, there was art programs. Our facilities opened early that day. Um, parks and facilities were open at 547, hence the name of the program. So thank you all for, um, for your work. The next award received was for Best New Environmental Sustainability Award. And this was for the Wildflower um, Pilot Project. Um, this new, initi new initiative received top honors based on its creative and innovative design, effectiveness in addressing environmental issue, the impact to the community, efficient use of re resources, and overall excellence. And this project was led by Parks Administrator Alexander Perkinson, along with a county team inclusive of general services, Keep James City County Beautiful in the Historic Rivers chapter of Virginia Master Naturalist. So if Alexander can come on up and represent that group. And this pilot project replaced um, a mowed grass area at the entrance of Freedom Park. And the creative idea reduced mowing by staff, created a new habitat for pollinators, and added to the beautification of a busy traffic corridor in our county. So thank you, Alexander. <laughs> And the next award received was for most innovative marketing piece. And this was for our Boo Bash at the Beach floor decal. Um, this new marketing strategy received top honors for excellence and um, promotional strategy, method of design, method of distribution, and uniqueness. And this was led by program coordinator Joy Johnson. So she will come on up. And Joy created this as another marketing avenue to um, educate citizens of our annual Boo Bash at the Beach event. Um, and she did it for a low $85. And probably in a, a place that doesn't appear so obvious for marketing, which was the floor of the <laughs> recreation center. So that was hence the uniqueness. And over the two week promotional period, over thousands of visitors um, saw this um, marketing strategy. So thank you, Joy. And Joy, if you can remain up. And Joy was also um, at the award ceremony, not only did it recognize programs and initiatives, but also individuals. Individuals who excelled. Um, in the state of Virginia, and Joy was recognized as um, the Virginia Parks and Recreation's um, two, 2018 Outstanding New Professional. And she received this honor based on her commitment to the Parks and Recreation field, leadership, contributions to the community, and involvement in local and state, um, on the local and state level. And I can personally say I get a chance to work with Joy, you know, every single day. So she really does approach her work with an outstanding work ethic and truly is commended by others who work with her for her organizational skills, her responsiveness to staff and customers, and her professionalism. So thank you, Joy. And um, in closing, I would like to also just reckon, um, recognize other Parks and Rec staff that are um, here today. Uh, certainly, everything that we do is a team effort, and it takes a supporting cast. So I'd like to thank our director, John Carnifax, our Recreation Centers Administrator, Carla Brittle, our Senior Communications Specialist, Vita McMullen, Operations Manager, Kelly Herbert. Kelly actually wrote the nomination for Joy for Outstanding New Professional. And, um, and Julie, um, Julie Northcott Wilson is here as well, and she's our business manager. And I would like to thank you all and the residents of um, James City County for the opportunity to present to you and for your support of our department and staff. Thank you. Thank the uh, Parks and Rec and all the award winners for the outstanding job. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to to see this kind of recognition for the folks on, on our staff and, and that work for our citizens. Okay, the next one is going to be our VDOT quarterly update. Mr. Rossi Carroll. 
Good evening, Chairman Eisenhower, other distinguished uh, board members. Uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I will give the quarterly update um, for VDOT, the maintenance accomplishments for this quarter. Um, we completed 793 of the 899 work orders that we received uh, between July and September. Um, the 106 outstanding are mostly drainage and a few roadway and vegetation. Uh, that is an 88% completion rate for this quarter. A few highlights of the accomplishments are we uh, completed a drainage project in the Norge area. Uh, we also did about 9,500 feet of roadside ditching. Um, we've done site distance, um, site triangle clearing for Route 60 and Route 30. Uh, we patched over 200 potholes throughout the county, uh, did also asphalt patching equate to 20 tons. Uh, we did drainage repair on Route 60 near uh, Westminster, also Route 60 near Barnes Road, and then a uh, uh, replacement, cross drain replacement there at Diaskins Road. Uh, mowing, we completed our third full mowing cycle in August. Uh, we did a primary only in September, and our next mowing and final mowing will, for the primary and secondary system will start in early November. Uh, Few projects. Um, one completed project is Powhatan finally arrived. Uh, that dedication was that for that was on uh, September the 30th. So it's good to have uh, a Powhatan uh, ferry in our fleet, and it will replace the uh, the, the Virginia. So uh, I'm glad to glad to say that that is here, even though it has been um, a little behind schedule getting it from Alabama. Uh, some projects. Uh, I-64 widening there at segment three. Um, that is, construction is ongoing. Um, we uh, work, is, is, they're working on the bridges. Um, also, they're also uh, widening to the uh, inside and um, should be completed by June of 2021. And uh, everything seems to be going fairly well. Um, we also have joint closure and overlay for bridges in James City and Surrey County. Uh, the Glasshouse side or Jamestown side of the Scotland Ferry was also epoxy. That was complete. Uh, they're working on the Queens Creek Bridge on 199 now. Um, and then they have another bridge in Williamsburg at Ucrops Way that they'll be going to next. Uh, we also have the plant mix schedule, um, which is uh, getting close to completion. The completion date for that is uh, early December. Uh, we have some punch list items uh, left to do, um, some of them on James Wood and Maple Lane. Um, we also have some uh, rumble strip installation on 199, and we're still doing snow pliable markers on Route 60. Um, they still have Chenko's grant um, to complete, and um, that, that should be it for the, uh, the PM5E plant mix schedule. Long Hill Road widening um, project um, is from 199 to Old Town Road. That is a Smart Scale 18 project. Uh, projected start date for the construction is the end of uh, this month. Um, with the following activities, traffic will remain in the current alignment. We'll install a temporary sidewalk, uh, relocation uh, of utilities um, in the roadway. A temporary traffic signal will be installed at Long Hill and Williamsburg West and construction is scheduled for completion in the fall of 2021. Uh, we also, with that project, uh, we have a uh, Old Town and Long Hill Turn Lane uh, Improvements Project. It's a rev share project uh, that will be completed during the same time, uh, time frame. This project will extend the existing right turn lane and adjacent sidewalk uh, at that intersection. Uh, we have the News Road and Centerville Road project. That is to increase the safety and capacity at this intersection. Um, they will be constructing a right turn lane on News Road, a right and left turn lane on Centerville Road, and adding a new traffic signal. Um, right away is complete. Construction is projected to start in December of this year with a completion in late 2020. Uh, we have the Skiss Creek Connector. 
Um, that is construct two lane road connecting from Route 60 to 143. Uh, the project is a design build uh, project and it's in that process. We are anticipating an early award in early 2020 with a completion in 2022. And uh, Croker Road, uh, four lane widening from the library to Route 60. Um, that's to widen the road to increase capacity from um, Pono Woods Road to Route 60. It's uh, currently in the PE process. We conducted a public hearing um, about a week ago and um, right away is subject to start or is uh, will start September of 2020 with construction to start uh, scheduled in 2023. Then we have sidewalk and bikeway on Route 60 from Croker to Old Church Road. It's approximately four mile sidewalk and bike lane project to increase pedestrian and bikeway connectivity. Project is being coordinated with the uh, Croker Road widening, which you'll connect to. And also currently the project is in PE with projected start uh, construction in 2021. Uh, we do have Smart Scale 20. Uh, that's the Long Hill Road shared use path. And that construction of the shared use path to fill the gap between the Long Hill Road project and also from Depew Drive uh, to, to Lane Place uh, P start in early 2020 with construction scheduled in 2024. So uh, we've also completed quite a few traffic studies this quarter. Um, route uh, Monticello Avenue at Monticello Marketplace, the right turn lane control. Uh, we're looking at adding some delineators there. Um, also the uh, Mill Pond Run, um, stalling 25 mile per hour speed limit sign. Um, and we've provided those to install. Uh, Long Hill Road, lane assignment review, uh, that came up with no change. Uh, Route 31, Jamestown Road, beach access sign review. Um, and we're looking at uh, how to put the weight limit in there so that that will be changed or swapped out. Uh, the Route 199, um, we're changing the yield, side, uh, yield sign to added lane sign. And then also we did a uh, forge road review um, and it's just installing or we've already installed the littering is illegal signs there on forge road and then we had the news road at uh, at um, powhatan secondary uh, that was a right turn sign review and uh, that, that said yes recommended a right turn and then route 31 jamestown road install speed limit sign beacon uh, currently working the installation for that um, projected in the next 90 days um, so that's on James Road. We're in the process of uh, we did work Hurricane Dorian um, however it was pretty much a non-event for us which is a good thing and we are in the middle of our dry runs getting prepared um, our contractors and our own equipment and personnel for this coming snow season so um, emergency response wise um, what we're doing um, that concludes my uh, quarterly update I'll be glad to take any questions or comments from the board at this time I have a few um, we talked about of course with the extra traffic on one side of Jolly Pond uh, looking at that traffic light once again and seeing what um, benefit that would be and also at Ford Road and 60 by the firehouse a possible light there as well and I know that Supervisor Sadler is also going to mention a light in her district um, <clears throat> and down 60 through Lightfoot Norge and Toano um, where the the breaks in the um, drainage area and the concrete the grass is growing up in there and when we haven't rained in quite a while which is a good thing but when it does rain heavily that pushes that water out into the road further can we do something as far as on 60 itself and it's just shoving more it's, it's having to go around all that grass and to get to the um drop inlets and it's causing more water out into the highway than than what's necessary thank you that's all thank you good evening i had uh, someone reach out to me today regarding um neighborhood speedings speeding and had read they had had this in a neighborhood they had lived, lived in previously, and the suggestion was made for a thin 
uh, or not a, not a thin line, but a stripe on the outside of the road that gave the appearance that there was a thin bike lane or narrow bike lane. And in studies, those types of things had, had shown that people tended to go slower, even if there were not people in the, the lane, and wondered if, that, if um, BDOT had ever talked about anything like that in the neighborhood. If there was that in the neighborhood, it is worn off. So I apologize if you're about to tell me that that's done. No, no, that, that's part of traffic calming. I mean, okay. just, a, just, just a chicanes, um, pavement markings, narrowing lanes, <laughs> speed humps, all of that's part of um, traffic calming. Some, some subdivisions, the pavement widths allow, you know, to have narrowed lanes. Um, some of them are barely 16 or 18 foot, so it's part of that same, part of that traffic calming. Um, and when, some, when something like that is looked at, who is responsible for the pay the payment of something like that? If a, if a neighborhood was interested in having something like that done, is that something the neighborhood would take responsibility for and working with VDOT? Or? We certainly will work with HOAs or the neighborhood on that. Um, you know, through our uh, through our traffic calming, it, it, we would review to see what would be the best um, best avenue. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. It just depends upon the location. But there's a lot of different um, ways to go to try to calm traffic okay. um, to, to look slower speeds. But um, there is a process. Some parts are eligible, some are not. Um, and it's going to take a, a, all the community to buy into it. Okay. Which is part of it, because I think a lot of times it's, and I, I think I talked to you about it before, speed bumps, but I think um, there's a noise factor with the speed. Not everybody wants, I don't know that you're going to get everybody to buy into a speed bump. Um, wondered if there was any update on the intersections of 5 in Centerville and 5 in Green Springs? Um, we are in the, you know, we did the RSA. Yes, sir. Um, we have the signage um, scheduled to be updated, The what I call the um, immediate recommendations from the RSA. Um, and we also are reviewing the speed limit on Route 5 through that area as well. So that's what we're in the process of doing at this current moment. Great. And then the... Last question is that I notice, and I'm not, I'm just asking you to get me with the right person. Um, the signs on the interstate for tourism markers are very dirty, which make, can make it very hard to see if you're, if it's in the evenings or, and um, who, is that something that's on a rotation? Do they get power wash? Do they not get power, is that, um, I believe the sign that you're speaking of was a um, joint, um, the, the historical triangle sign. That's one I noticed on 64. That brown, was, mm -hmm, brown. One. That yeah. was really dirty. But I've been, I've been. That that was purchased through Williamsburg, James City, York County. Um, so Mr. Hipple needs to go clean well, it. it, it um, <laughs> I will. I will check with Virginia Logos. Okay. To see um, who is maintaining that. Um, okay. But. You could just let me know. That'd be great. I will. It's it's either through Virginia Logos or it's through um, through the localities. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Carroll. Good evening. As um, Mr. Hipple mentioned, the area right there at Forge Road and Route 60, I've had several people mention to me again um, about the difficulty they have getting out because the speed limit right there is 45, and it's posing a problem. Um, Certainly a light it could be warranted or even a reduction in speed limit might be something that could be looked into because people are um, Like I said, they're having a hard a hard time people have commented before because they feel like that 45 mile per hour where it Jumps up to 45 heading west and vice versa needs to be pushed up closer to the bridge. But anyway, um, people are having an issue right there um, Stonehouse Elementary, sir three accidents since 9-11. September 11th, September 25th, and October 2nd are the dates that I have listed here. I am just imploring 
upon VDOT to look into a stoplight there. I'm really fearful that something serious is going to happen right there. So I would ask once again that you look into a light and um, see what we can do. It's becoming increasingly difficult to get through that area just because of the build out right there in Whitehall. There's more, the population has grown in that spot and um, people are having a, a difficult time. I, I think I sent you a photograph of the one, um, uh, I, I can't remember which accident was, may have been October 2nd, but people are, are letting me know about it again. So they're very, very concerned in that area. I appreciate any help that you can give us for that spot. Thank you. That's it. Hey, Mr. Carroll, thanks first of all for uh, all the responsiveness that you've given uh, to the um, various requests and, and uh, uh, projects that I've, I've asked you to take a look at. Let me start off with a couple of things that you mentioned here, just for my own clarification. Um, so on the Croker Road uh, uh, four-lane widening, will that uh, um, is that going to include uh, uh, bicycle lanes and, or pedestrian Separated. access? Separated. Separated path. On, Great, okay. Yep. And so um, then I, I note that uh, from Croker Road on Route 60 up to Old Church uh, Road, um, there's going to be sidewalk or, uh, and uh, bikeway. Um, will there be pedestrian and bicycle access across Route 60? You tell me about a crosswalk on Route 60 right. at that intersection right. of Croker, and um, yes, that's what is part of the plan is to look at that crosswalk um, connectivity. Yeah, because I, I know we won't have we there. won't have one on the on the north side of Route 60 no. there, right? So. If people are interested in using bicycles and, and uh, walk, or walking on sidewalks, they really have to be on that south side. Let me, let me look into that. I know both plans. Yeah. Um, I know the sidewalk and bicycle plan has mm -hmm. something with crosswalks at that area, but I want to just double check and make sure that you're talking coming from right. the pedestrian path or Route 60 crossing over towards the church or That's towards right. the neighborhood. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. And so since we're talking about crosswalks and, and pedestrians and bikeways, I, I uh, sent you a, a message earlier today just to kind of give you a heads up. Uh, I have received a request from a constituent to uh, get an explanation for the process by which um, she could request consideration of pedestrian or bicycle crossing of 199 right here uh, to go over to the shopping center. Uh, she points out the fact that uh, we're encouraging people to use bicycles and uh, to walk to, to various destinations. And I just wanted to ask if there is a process, especially on a, on a limited access road like 199. There uh, is, and um, this is a very tough one. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I figured that was be, be 199 the is a limited access road. However, this section of 199 does not prohibit um, pedestrian or bicyclist. Um, mm -hmm. You do have a crossing. Just have to take at, your life in your hands. Yeah, you, you do have a crossing there at uh, Route 31 and uh, yes, right. Route 199. Right. Um, I will say that this this intersection does bring some some challenges. Um, one first being there is no sidewalks or or um, I, uh, or separated uh, walk paths in these areas. Uh, Mounts Bay is actually a private road, uh -huh. and Quarter Path, which is across 199, is actually in the city. City, right? Um, so to have a crosswalk, you have to have um, some sort of facility, uh, mm -hmm. a pedestrian facility, to have a crosswalk. Um, neither of those are currently in place on either side of 199. So um, I also I would say that. Um, Putting a crosswalk in this portion of 199 certainly would lower the level of service. Um, so that would be one of the things we would look at. Now there's there's pedestrian bridges, there's other things that help with that, um, but they're very costly. Um, but for us to review a crosswalk request, um, the facilities have to be in place um, or, or be able to be put in place to allow a crosswalk. Okay. Thank you for, for the explanation. I can pass that on to, to the citizen, and I will then direct her to you if she seeks That's further fine. information. Right. Uh, let me also then ask about, um, uh, or just mention to you that uh, uh, I, I noticed uh, that the vegetation, I think, again, is uh, uh, very uh, high 
uh, on Jackson Drive and in James Terrace, uh, right where just before it intersects with Adams Dri Adams Road, uh, and uh, wanted to um, uh, just kind of. Um, be a pain in the neck about uh, Lake Powell Road off of Neckaland Road, which has not been uh, resurfaced in a couple of decades and really is in awful shape. It's a relatively short piece of, of, of road, and I really hope that it can be evaluated for possible inclusion next year. I know that it's not the, uh, it doesn't score as highly on some of the um, indicators, but uh, it is, it is a tough uh, road uh, and has been torn up quite a bit in recent years. And uh, finally, just to, to um, say that I'm, I'm certainly hopeful that we'll be able to get some uh, success with seeking funding for the project that is uh, um, on, the, on the books ready to uh, get going as soon as we have adequate funding for Route 60 East. Thank you. And Mr. Carroll, I just have two short uh, items. Number one is on the Skiffs Creek connector. Um, it, with uh, this as being a design-build process, is has all of the um, property been acquired for this, or is that still part of the process that uh, would have to go through this design-build? Yeah, that's that's part of the process. Okay, so we we we're... don't have we don't have the purchase of all the property yet that's Sorry. necessary for that. That's Sorry. part of this whole. Okay, that that answers that one question for me. The other was your traffic studies completed, and I believe this is the one where we were talking about earlier this evening, which is uh, 321 Monticello Avenue at Monticello Marketplace. This is the right turn. Is this the right turn lane that comes off of 199 that goes to News Road? Is that the one that ends and then yeah. it goes to News Road? Yeah. I think it is. Okay. Let me um, there. actually have it here with me, so I'm going to leave it with you. Okay. All right. I, I would appreciate that because... Uh, um, I had a very irate constituent who also happened to be my wife <laughs> um, who uh, came very close to getting our car totaled at that intersection because somebody, people persist in uh, not turning right into uh, and going straight on through that last little bit and creating some real, uh, some real hazards. So uh, I think we discussed a couple of options. One would be to, to put some sort of devices that would force the right turn or the other one uh, like the pole, poles or the other one would be to, to make it uh, right and straight uh, as another we're, option we were looking at something like um, sort of like we have at uh, Long Hill yes, and um, old old town, town. Okay. Um, just just to show, show that you have to turn right at that point I, I think it would it would be helpful because uh, unfortunately most of the people I see running it are not out-of-towners they're locals who ought to know better uh it seems to be sort of like a, a, a drag strip <laughs> mr chair um, can i just jump on, on sure. one, one last point uh, on the traffic studies that you, uh, uh the very last one uh, where about on jamestown road would that uh um installing the, of the speed limit uh, sign beacon be that is um right there at neckerland oh at neckerland okay yeah. right uh we're yep. coming from jamestown Right before you get to Neckerland. And, and uh, the light beacon is just, is, is it a flashing light? A flashing light, light yeah. Flashing sort light. of like we have for the intersection of Route 5 and 614, okay. just to bring notice. You know, right. we, put the, we put the upside sign, and then we also put the notice placard out there. Um, but we're going to add a uh, flashing yellow light to um, help bring a, awareness of the speed. Thank you. Hey, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Appreciate your, well, your report. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, our final one is uh, a presentation by Soil and Water Conservation District Report, Mr. Bob Lund. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Kinsman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Bob Lund, one of two directors elected from James City County to represent us at the Colonial Soil and Water Conservation Conservation District. With me is James Wallace, our district manager, and Robin Goad, our urban conservationist. Our annual report for this past fiscal year is in your package and available on the district website. Ah, oh, there we go. Districts encourage voluntary conservation efforts. While continuing focus on agricultural conservation, the Colonial District is increasing its urban and suburban role with homeowners and other non-agricultural property owners. The Colonial District covers 825 square miles, is home to about 175,000 people, 
and currently employs six staff members. Supplemental funding from local governments and grants allow our district to support more than the state-funded agricultural cost share program. Substantial increases of these supplements, including a significant Virginia Environmental Endowment Grant, enabled the district to accomplish more in James City. This map illustrates agriculture in James City with mainland farms and a horse paddock surrounded by suburban development. James City has about 3,150 acres of cropland. The Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program helps defray the cost of conservation practices on farmland in James City. Cost share funds for this program increased substantially for this fiscal year and appear to be more than our farmers are motivated to utilize under the current program. The Colonial District is advocating for program changes to ease the burden on participants in an effort to get more practices installed. The district provides technical advice for farms of all sizes to help address agricultural problems. Conservation planning mandated by the Bay Act needs local funding and is no longer funded by the state. James City County supplemental funds continue to enable this effort. The district collaborates with James City County staff on parcel selection and is uniquely qualified to conduct such assessments due to technical expertise and Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program financial incentives for better practices. This two-year grant funds Colonial District efforts and provides 450000 to mitigate landowner expense of ad adopting these practices. It addresses over 28,000 acres of cropland along the north bank of the James in two soil and water and conservation districts. More precise site-specific management better aligns inputs such as fertilizer and seed with desired outputs, thus reducing inefficiencies and pollution. The Colonial District was invited to apply for this grant, partly due to prior participation in research on these techniques and work with early adopters. The Colonial District proudly assists the Jamestown High School Envirothon team by providing financial, technical, and administrative support. We continue encouraging other schools to participate in Envirothon. Since 2016, the district has partnered with local nonprofit Williamsburg Community Growers on shared programs and missions, including demonstrating conservation practices that help build healthy soil and improve water quality. This past fiscal year, district support included grant applications and technical advice. Additionally, the Colonial District facilitated access to lower cost camp experiences via forestry and youth conservation camps, provided technical support for community gardens such as the Garden and Grove, formerly managed by Rob Till, secured a $5,000 award from the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund for installation of an environmental walking tour, highlighting environmental features adjacent to the Warhill Sports Complex. The district provides a valuable conservation education resource with unique knowledge and tailored programs, complementing other sources of technical advice and education. The Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, in its third offering year from the Colonial District, addresses previously developed properties, supported practices, redirect or manage rainwater so it is used by plants or soaks into the ground, improving water reserves, thus reducing stormwater volume and decreasing risk of floods, erosion, and pollution of our ponds, streams, and rivers. VCAP complements James City County's Clean Water Heritage programs and other programs such as we heard of tonight uh, by James City County as well. Growing interest in VCAP generated more than 32 district site visits in James City two-thirds of them this past fiscal year. Unfortunately, the program's technical assistance stipend covers less than half of district operational expenses for VCAP. 
In addition to formal program reports to James City County staff, the Colonial District also updates the Stormwater Programs Advisory Committee at their meetings. District participation in these meetings promote accessibility and approachability. In addition to our own technical expertise, the district can access a broad range of resources to help answer James City County questions and address James City County concerns. The Colonial District Partnership Continuing Turf Love for County Residents included hiring long-term turf love expert Bob Winters to continue working with the program. The district also promotes Garden Love, a historic James City County program. Combining Garden Love with VCAP enabled continued work with and reimbursement of homeowners seeking to create a rain garden on their property. The district is grateful for the assistance of master gardener and rain garden expert Carol Fryer, who designs beautiful functional rain gardens for garden love. The Colonial District conducted an equine census for the county in these three selected James City watersheds. The survey conducted on nearly 2,350 individual tax parcels in these watersheds found 102 parcels with horses or horse infrastructure. Based on those results, the survey team believes there are 350 horses in the surveyed area and between 700 to 750 horses countywide. Issues were found at most horse sites. Horse management can be an environmental concern as each horse generates approximately 50 pounds of manure daily. Horses can cause soil erosion through pasture damage by overgrazing and with their hooves when in limited space. Proposal elements, including a second phase, have already been discussed with James City County staff. These include a census of the horse population in the rest of the county, also a pilot program to start reducing the environmental impact of horses by measures such as improved on-site manure management, enhanced pasture quality, and increased use of constructed heavy use areas for pasture protection. The General Assembly earmarked $1 million for the VCAP Conservation Assistance Program this year for installation of VCAP practices. Potential interest in the program is huge. The limiting factor is insufficient technical support funding. Less than 50% of the district VCAP operational costs are covered by the technical assistance stipend, paid only after a completed practice is, in, is installed and certified. The district continues to work with the program as available resources allow. A complete horse census would clarify the environmental improvement opportunity with the horse population. Currently, the Virginia Agricultural Cost Share Program does not address the kind of horse operations in James City. Discussions about change to that program are moving slowly, with little indication of change beneficial to local horse operations because of likely horse stocking rate limitations. Reduced turf flood funding has limited what could be accomplished. The district believes there is opportunity to accomplish significantly more with this program. That concludes our report. If there are any questions. Questions for Mr. Long? Questions, but thank you very much for yes. the very thorough report. Oh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Beth. Okay, we now move to public comment. And, uh, first speaker of this evening is Mr. Jeff Anthony. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you for a few moments. Your agenda suggests you've got a lot of work to do, so I'm going to be very brief. <laughs> Promise. Uh, you won't have to cut me off like last time. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I live in the county. I'm very much involved in this subject called Pickleburg. Later in the pickleball. Later in the agenda, you're going to talk about an approval consideration for the Veterans Park pickleball court renovation. I'm here speaking tonight on behalf of the pickleball player community 
and offering our total absolute support for a favorable consideration. Uh, when I was here in March of 2018, uh, speaking to you about the game and the resources, we were looking at the gap between the number of courts available and the growing population. Back then, we had uh, the two dedicated courts at Veterans Park, and the club that I run, which is just an inform informative club for people who want to keep track of the game in the area, I had about 200 members. That was March of it, 2018. Since that time, we still have the, the two courts. They're in horrible condition. Surface coming up, um, I suspect we talked about that. But we are now have grown from 200 to 462 members, and that does not include the members that are playing and the players all over the community. Those are just those that sign up for information through my website. So uh, with that in mind, I just want to do three things, and that's three thank yous. Uh, the first thank you is to Parks and Recreation, the leadership and staff who share our passion for this amenity and this sport called pickleball. Now, there's a lot I could say about that, but their heads are so big already from all the awards <laughs> they've got tonight. I'm just, we're just going to let that go, uh, although we could spend a lot of time on that. They do an incredible job taking care of this part of the population and balancing all the other amenities. Uh, I want to thank the players themselves who do everything they can to make sure everyone who has an interest in this game, which is still the fastest growing sport in the country, if you want to know about it, all you have to do is walk on a court and say, can I play? And the answer is yes, absolutely. And for me, the lesson came when I first started in 2011, when I moved to the county, I met a gentleman named Dean Hinders. And he's one of those folks, if you know him, he's bridge extraordinaire. Um, he's the, the, one of the first people I asked, can I play? And his basic response to me was, Jeff, this is a game you can play for fun and you can play it for life. He's the, one of the guys that got me involved in this. Dean passed away this year in May. He was 83 years old, and he was a player late, all the way into his 80s. So the last thing I'd like to say is uh, to the board, Mr. Chairman, to the board, thank you in advance for your favorable approval <laughs> of the contract. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, our second uh, public speaker is Peg Borman. Mr. Chairman, that's real confidence they're leaving before we even vote. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon and thank you, Matt. Mr. Chairman Eisenhower, members of the board, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Kinsman, Mr. Purse, Mr. Holt, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peg Borman. I live at 17 Settlers Lane in Lightfoot area. And I come again today to talk the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and a little bit of trash. Uh, I once again want to encourage and urge everyone to reduce their amount of trash. And yes, I always want to talk trash because there's so much of it out there. Uh, I run down 199 and it'll be nice and clean because I see all the orange bags and the people that have picked them up and then the next day I go down and it's like who let the dogs out and they tore up all of the cushions or something but anyway uh, I want to also urge people to reuse things as much as possible and above all recycle now I know that recycle is a hot topic right now but it is the right thing to do, and we must do it right. The recycle bin is not for those dirty diapers or anything that's not going to be recycled. It's, for, uh, it's not for those pizza boxes either that some of the schools thinks that they can put in there, which that's not uh, for recycling, nor the yogurt cups that we once tossed into the bins. But, so make sure that you're recycling only 
the plastic bottles with the necks and don't look at the markings on the bottom of the container because that's misleading. Uh, cardboard, glass bottles, cans, metal, and aluminum are all um, going into the curbside carts. Larger items can be dropped off at the convenience centers. And remember, you can also recycle those plastic bags at the grocery stores as well as at the convenience centers. And Recyclopedia is a very good tool, and that's on the website. I want to give out a shout tonight to Grace Boone, who's general manager of General Services, Joanne Ripley, Pam Dawson, Holly Haney, Pat Smith, Josh Norris, Lauren, Mariah, Janice, Meredith, and all the others in general services, along with Jim Hill and his group that was with Recycling and Solid Waste. They've all been working very diligently and mostly hard at this particular point in meeting the needs of the residents of James City County and the recycling program. And they get very little thanks, but they get a lot of grief. So there are others that I know I probably have missed, and I apologize for that, but I just couldn't think of everybody at the point in time I was writing my notes. But I also don't want to forget Don Alexi. Did I pronounce that right? Our Clean County Commission Coordinator. Although she wears many, many hats, we especially appreciate all that she does to help us with the mission of the Clean County Commission. And now I don't want you to forget and remember, put it on your calendars, there will be more to come later. November 9th is our Litter and Recycling Expo, and it will be at Jolly Pond. I want to thank you for listening to my comments today. As you know, I hate litter, and I talk trash a lot, but I really want to urge everyone to do their part in litter prevention and recycle, and do it wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borman. Okay, that concludes our public comment. Mr. Chairman. Um, well, Ms. Borman's right here. Let me just uh, also point out that uh, the Keep James City County Beautiful uh, committee that uh, uh, she is heads up uh, was also uh, involved in one of the parks and recreation programs, the wildflower program, uh, that won a, an award. So just uh, thank you for that work, too. Okay, we move on to our consent calendar, and uh, this evening we have uh, number one, minutes adoption, uh, number two, grant award, Kinship Navigator Program, $67,146, number three, grant award, Functional Exercise and Education to Thrive Program, $20,000, number four, authorization to enter into memoranda of understanding with private entities for the provision of services and shelter in times of emergency, Number five, contract award leaf collection services, $210,000. And number six, initiation of a review of zoning ordinance to include beekeeping as a use permitted in certain residential districts. And I will look for the board for a motion, uh, or does anyone push to pull anything? I just want to pull six. Okay, we'll pull number six. I'll move the remainder of the consent calendar. Okay, we have sure. a motion for the uh, first five. Uh, Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Number six. We'll yes, the only three. reason that I pulled it was because I just want to make sure that it doesn't get caught in the consent agenda uh, and, and nobody um, noticing that, you know, this is a this is a change that would possibly allow beekeeping into R1. And so um, if anybody is interested, they can go on and read the resolution, but just um, whether you are pro bees uh, in the, or, or I mean, I doubt anybody's anti bee, but they may have take issue with something about it. And so just want to make sure that people are paying attention and get involved as we start talking about it. Okay. Good point. Thank you. This does just essentially that, move. initiate initiate uh, the uh, review so that we can examine the pros and cons in a, in a public hearing. Uh, so you have a, we have a motion to approve number six. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We now move on to public hearings, and uh, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, 
uh, Planning Commission representative this evening, uh, Odessa Dowdy, is uh, with us to cover help us on a couple of items. Uh, the first one uh, the night is um, an ordinance to authorize the Williamsburg James City County Public School Division to install and operate a video monitoring system in or on school buses. And Ms. Parman will give the presentation. Yes, good evening and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, before you is an ordinance to amend Chapter 13 of the James City County Code by adding Section 13-28 to allow the Williamsburg James City County School Board to install and operate video monitoring systems on school buses. Um, to record drivers who fail to stop when school buses are taking on or discharging children. Um, school bus drivers are reporting increasing incidents of drivers failing to stop for buses in our community, um, and, the school, and the schools hope that a video monitoring system will improve enforcement. Um, this ordinance also allows the school division to contract with a private vendor to um, obtain and operate uh, video monitoring services, and this also directs that all civil penalties from violations be directed to the schools. And I recommend approval of the proposed ordinance. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Any questions for Ms. Barber? Can, go ahead. Could you talk a little bit about the penalty part? Um, so it's, it's similar to a, you know, it's in this same section of the Virginia Code that authorizes the locality to do this. Um, enforcement would be similar to like a, a red light traffic stop. Um, I don't know the exact amount of penalties, but it would be similar to um, traffic, a traffic infraction. I've paid a couple for college students. Would you like me to tell you what that's like? <laughs> Certainly, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, thank you. So if, if a violator is, is caught running, then it would basically be like the traffic light. They would um, mail a um, letter to them telling them that their fine is X, and that's what they would need to pay and, and send it back. Yes, that's the idea, and um, a review of these videos would fall to our police department, and this is something that they've agreed that they can do. Okay. Next question, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Let me move. Yeah. Oh, it's a public I'll, hearing. I'll, I'll open the public hearing. We have no cards on this I'll one. move the public I'll hearing. I'll close, close the public hearing, and now yeah, we can, can have a discussion over motion. I'll move the motion. Okay. We have a motion. Stevens, call the roll. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Our second public hearing is an ordinance to amend County Code Section 9-7 and Section 9-8 to require the installation of and maintenance of smoke alarms in residential buildings in conformance with the Virginia Code 15.2-922. Ms. Parman again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, before you is an ordinance to amend sections 9-7 and 9-8 of the county code regarding smoke alarms in residential buildings. Uh, this is largely a housekeeping measure to bring our code in line with the state code. Uh, Virginia Code section 15.2-922 is the current authority for these sections, and it was last amended in 2018 to clarify that smoke alarms shall comply with the statewide fire prevention code and the uniform statewide building code and also that localities cannot require upgrading of smoke alarms bef uh, beyond the requirements of the universe, uh, Uniform Statewide Building Code. Um, the 2018 revisions also require that tenants maintain smoke alarms in non-public spaces in accordance with the Virginia Landlord Tenant Act. Uh, previously, landlords were required to repair re defective smoke alarms when notified by tenants within five days, so that requirement has been removed. Um, the proposed ordinance um, mirrors the Virginia Code, and I recommend approval of the proposed ordinance. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Question. Um, so I've got a couple rental properties, and, and that's a yearly thing that we do. And, and send. And now, would that get sent into the county now? Is there? How would we track this? No, that's uh, that's necessarily a requirement in the Virginia Landlord Tenant Act. So that's a private right of action if tenants um, feel that they're not getting those notifications timely then they can um, then they can you know deal deal with that with their landlord in our county code we're, we're we're basically saying that landlords have to comply with the statewide building code they have to comply with the um, fire prevention code and that they do have to give tenants at least one uh, confirmation that their smoke alarms work um, 
there's not a whole lot of enforcement that goes on with this. We can certainly ask the landlord for a copy of that certification, but there's no requirement that landlords mail in a certification to the county. Okay, that, that's what I was going to check on because we do it yearly and have a company that inspects them right. just to make sure we keep it on record. I didn't know if that would be something that we'd be required to send it into the county or any, anyone else, but it's just more for our records and this is just to bring us up to state codes. Exactly, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, no other questions? I'll open the public hearing. We have no cards. Close the public hearing. Look to the board for a motion. Motion for approval. Okay, motion for approval. Ms. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Moving right along, we have. Public hearing number three, Virginia Department of Transportation Project Number UPC 100920, Croker Road Widening, Underground Utilities. Mr. Holt. Good evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. As Mr. Carroll mentioned earlier this evening, on September 26th, VDOT held a design public hearing at Freedom Park and presented the preliminary plans to widen Croker Road from two lanes to four lanes from Richmond Road to the library. The section of Croker Road is projected to warrant widening based on future traffic projections. The design will maintain and implement desirable access management strategies, a multi-purpose trail to connect residential and commercial areas, and the library will be constructed, and it will improve the Rose Lane and Croker Road intersection as well. An important aspect of this project is the undergrounding of existing utilities in the corridor. The policy basis for undergrounding existing utilities has been contained in the comprehensive plan since, since 1997. In the 2015 update to the comprehensive plan and in those prior, the community character action item calls for prioritizing these community character corridors for funding of the placement of existing utilities underground. This portion of Croker Road has been identified within the Norge community character area since 1997 and this portion of Richmond Road has been identified as a community character corridor since 2003. The update to the comprehensive plan notes that placing existing utilities underground can be very costly and difficult, and it goes on to say that the most efficient way to accomplish this and, and the burial of, of utility lines is in conjunction with transportation projects where the county does not have to bear the full costs of those costs on those projects, excuse me. One of the most recent examples where existing overhead utility lines <coughs> were placed underground was part of the Iron Bound Road reconstruction project. Other past projects include Jamestown Road and Route 5, and consistent with board action in 2017, overhead utilities are currently being placed underground as part of the Long Hill Road corridor project. Undergrounding of utilities is also an important aspect of community character, and it helps to improve the reliability since underground utilities are less susceptible to damage during storm events and vehicle accidents. In order for the county to underground utilities as part of these projects, VDOT requires the adoption of an ordinance designated in Croker Road project limits as an underground utility district and the adoption of a resolution committing to fund the actual difference, cost difference between relocating the utilities overhead versus placing them underground. For this project, the preliminary estimate to relocate existing overhead electric, telephone, and cable TV lines within the project limits and place them underground is approximately 1.6 million. Funding available and programmed in the CIP is expected to be sufficient to cover these expected costs of relocating utilities as part of the transportation match project. And staff recommends the Board of Supervisors adopt the ordinance and resolutions contained in your agenda packets. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yes. Um, and, I, and I talked to VDOT, and they were going to, at the um, September 30th meeting, and they were going to look into it. The, the one thing that still worries me is where uh, Virginia Natural Gas put their little hut there yep. next to the bank, yep. real close to that intersection, and, and some of the engineers weren't aware of that. And so I asked them to look into that to see if that is, which I was worried might be in that right away that we need in order to get that road widened. And it's a shame because that thing just went in effect. And, you know, you would think there'd be a way that Virginia Natural Gas <clears throat> may know about these projects since this is a 20-year project in process, that they might have picked it up within a 20-year process. And and I hope that that's not in the way. And that if, if it is... Is that going to be something that we would have to share in the cost of 
relocating? I know that's a question out of the blue that I'm sorry. No, the county would not have to share in that cost. That would be a cost of the project if it had to be relocated or moved. Okay. But that wouldn't that would not be a cost to the to the county directly. That would be a project cost. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't have a question, Mr. Chair. I just want to let the board know that uh, when we get to board requests and directives, I have something I want to say about underground utilities. All righty. So, no other questions? We'll open the public hearing. Do we have any cards on this one? No. Close the public hearing. Now we'll look to the board for further discussion and or motion. Motion, motion to approve. approve. Oh, go ahead. Ms. Sadler will give the. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. All right. And we have uh, number four, which is ORD 19-0001, Zoning Ordinance Amendment to Section 24-16, Proffer of Conditions. Mr. Holt again. Back again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. On September 13th in 2016, the Board of Supervisors amended the zoning ordinance to state that the county would no longer accept proffers for residential applications. This was in reaction to Senate Bill 549 that was subsequently enacted and codified in the Code of Virginia. On March, of, March 5th of this year, General Assembly's proposed changes to the code were approved by the governor, and upon review, the revisions appear to address many of the concerns stated by the board when it adopted that 2016 ordinance. Accordingly, on April 9th of this year, the Board of Supervisors adopted an initiating resolution directing staff to more thoroughly, thoroughly consider those revisions and the effects of the new state code and to recommend any warranted changes to the James City County Zoning Ordinance to accept proffers associated with any new residential rezoning or zoning map amendment or with any new residential component of a multi-use district rezoning or zoning map amendment. Those changes are currently before you. Staff recommends approval of the ordinance as contained in your agenda packets. On September 4th, 2019, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this ordinance by a vote of six to one, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Holt or staff? Um, I, I had one, but I think I'll direct it to the county attorney. Um, this change, if I remember correctly, the, the state law basically allowed this new category, which we can now accept proffers under, but that the old legislation and the old process is still there and available to a developer if they so, so wish to apply under that old or old uh, state law, correct? Yes, sir. If we had not written the, uh, the proposed changes to 24-16 the way we did, the developer would have two options. The way we've written the proposed change to the ordinance, the developer has one option, which is to submit it basically like we used to. Okay. So they don't, they, they, with this, they don't have the option of going back and doing it. That's correct. We, we maintain our ability to not accept proffers, uh, and this, with this writing, it would only be if they submitted them under that particular subsection that basically takes you back to where we originally started. Okay. All right. That, yep, that's helpful. Thank you. All righty, we will now bring uh, Ms. Dowdy. Would you come forward? There you are. Great, thanks. Uh, would you please go over the, the, the Planning Commission d debate on this? Um, I really have nothing to add. Mr. Holt gave kind of a thorough explanation. Um, it was a six to one. We had one commissioner that had concerns about um, just not being ready to proceed with it at this time. Um, and he had concerns about residential growth and things like that related to proffers. Thank you. Right. Any other questions for now? Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll open the public hearing, and we don't have any on this one either, do we? Okay. Close the public hearing, and I'll look to the board for a motion. Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, let me just say that uh, this is an issue that local governments that have been experiencing rapid growth uh, have been concerned about for some time. The passage of the 2016 legislation was a tremendous mistake on the part of the General Assembly, uh, and uh, it essentially brought uh, consideration of cases to a halt uh, in, in many communities in, this, in the state. Um, the amendments to it in 2019 uh, were not perfect uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but they uh, did represent a significant improvement. Uh, they um, still, there, there are still ways in which that legislation um, 
has uh, t to be tested and uh, uh, my suspicion is that there will be some aspects of it that will not uh, hold up very well. But um, uh, we've, we are a member of the Coalition of High Growth Communities, and that coalition worked with the um, Home Builders Association and the General Assembly to try to, to get something that uh, we could um, work with. Uh, the way in which the, the uh, ordinance has been drafted here, I think, um, is very helpful, re retains our flexibility, and doesn't prevent us from doing, uh, from finding other ways to address the question of mitigation of the impact of, of uh, um, proposals. Um, so uh, I think on balance, um, it is worth it to show good faith in terms of uh, addressing the changes the General Assembly made uh, for us to adopt this and uh, see how it works. So unless anybody else wants to add anything, I'll move the adoption. Of the motion, please call the roll. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. And our fifth and last public hearing, SUP 19 0018, 6623 Richmond Road, Train Control System Assembly and Storage. Uh, Mr. Ribeiro. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Mr. Joseph Stenko of Diverging Approach Incorporation, or DAI has applied for SUP to allow for the processing, assembly, and storage of light industrial products within a portion of an existing structure located at 6623 Richmond Road. The property is on B1, General Business, and A1, General Agricultural, and is designated as mixed use on the, comprehensive, on the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. The entire structure is located within the B1 zoning district designation. Processing, assembly, and storage of light industrial pr products require an issuance of an SUP in B1 zoning districts. This SUP application proposes no additional impervious surface, no new buildings um, or expansions, only internal changes in the section of the existing structure subject to this SUP request. The business operation will take place in the back of the structure, while the existing and future commercial office uses will remain at the front part of the front part of the structure. DAI is a train signal and communications contractor. They do not manufacture any materials. Rather, they assemble different light industrial components from different sources to produce train signal systems. These components include ground materials such as cable, train control loops, junction boxes, program microprocessors, and instrument instrument shelters. Staff notes that all the operation associated with this, with this use will occur indoors. Therefore, potential impacts such as lighting, noise, dust, storage of materials will be contained within the structure. The, proposed, the proposal will generate a very limited amount of traffic with no impact to the right of way. The property is designated mixed use, light foot area on the 2035 comprehensive plan. Principal suggested uses are moderate density, housing, commercial, development, and office development. From a use standpoint, the current proposed use is considered light industrial, which is not a principal suggested use. However, the existing building continues to contain commercial uses, and the proposed use will include office elements as part of the light industrial use. Given this mix for the structure overall, and the fact that the proposed use has impacts that are similar or less than many retail and commercial uses, staff finds the use consistent with the comprehensive plan. Staff finds the proposal compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the comprehensive plan. On October 2nd, 2019, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this application with a vote of 6-0. Staff recommends the Board of Supervisors approve this application subject to the attached conditions. I'll be happy to answer any questions um, you may have. The applicant is also in attendance. Thank you. Okay. We'll start with any questions for staff. Okay. Um, let me then move to bring Ms. Dowdy back up and talk about the Planning Commission. <clears throat> um, not, nothing to add to this one as well. Pretty straightforward. Um, I think all commissioners were in agreement that this SUP should be approved. Okay. Any questions for her? Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome.
Okay, and at that point, um, we'll open the public hearing, and we have one speaker, and that's Mr. Vernon Gaddy representing the applicant. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I'm Vernon Getty. It's a pleasure to be here tonight representing the applicant, Diverging Approach. Uh, I want to introduce you to Joe Stanko, the president of Diverging Approach. Uh, I'll be very brief. First, I want to thank your staff and administration for getting us here so quickly on an expedited basis uh, and say this is a great business. It's a business you want in James City County. This allows them to remain in James City County and prosper. Um, it's an unusual case in that there are no changes actually approved. It's just a use. Um, so I would urge you to approve it, and I think you'll be glad you did. Thank you very much. Glad any, to answer questions. Any questions for Mr. Gannon? No. Thank any questions for the applicant at all? No, I just wanted to make a statement about okay, well, the process. Right. Let me close the public hearing, and we'll have the board discussion, and then I'll look for a motion. So I just wanted to speak on behalf of the, um, if I could, the EDA, Economic Development Authority, as the liaison from the board to that authority. A letter was sent by Mr. Tom Tingle, vice chair of the board, um, of the EDA, rather. Um, on behalf of the Economic Development Authority, I would like to offer my support of the expedited review process for Diverging Approach, Inc., uh, for their special use permit. Um, a company like DAI represents an entrepreneurial business that is part of several regional target sectors and is growing. James City County is proud to be where entrepreneurs can find their opportunity and the EDA is appreciative of staff and the board for employing the process of expedited review for this project. And I will be recommending approval. I, I would just add that um, I think this is a, a wonderful adaptive reuse of that building, which has been terribly underutilized uh, for quite a while. So I'll be supporting it as well. Uh, we look for a motion. Motion to All approve. Right, motion we approve. Mr. Hibble? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We now move to board considerations. Number one is contract award Veterans Park Pickleball Court Renovation. Mr. Carnifax. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, just a little brief history of uh, how we've gotten here today. Uh, the courts were constructed in 1983, uh, so they've been there for 30, uh, is that six, 36 plus years. Uh, starting in about 2000, uh, we've had issues with the subsurface of the asphalt. There were a lot of cracking, so in 2000, we did an overlay with an acrylic finish. Uh, we did that again. We were prepared to do that again this year at a tune of about 35000 And if you remember my conversations earlier with you, the city of Williamsburg was going to convert, had budgeted to convert four, three, excuse me, three of the seven Kiwanis courts to pickleball. Uh, so that was something they were planning on do. So we were going to come back and patch and coat again, hoping we could get another five years out of these courts. Uh, when the city did come forward with that, it was approved in their budget. The tennis community was not supportive. Uh, I attended a meeting in the city of Williamsburg, and there were about 90 uh, folks that showed up. Uh, and of course, only one was uh, not a James City County resident. I, I knew the majority of the folks that play at the Kiwanis tennis courts were James City County residents. So I showed up at the meeting. I kind of listened to their concerns, had some discussion with them. And just like it is nationally, the preference is instead of dual lining and trying is to build dedicated courts. So I spoke to the group and I said, well, this is something we've got to address. Um, we were planning on patching uh, the courts. Uh, what do you feel about converting them all to pickleball? So overwhelmingly, both the pickleball community and the tennis community convert uh, support this. The Kiwanis courts are lit, just like the Veterans Park court, so that will, and they serve by the far majority James City County residents, even though they're in, located in the city and they maintain and operate those. So the plan now is to move forward with converting these. There are several issues other than the subgrade with the courts. There's a 3% slope. In this 120 feet, it drops three feet when they were built in 1983. Courts are supposed to be at a 1% grade, and so we're gonna correct the grade on these courts as well as, as the subgrade. So we're basically going to go in, mill up the existing asphalt, recode it, uh, and uh, put it back to asphalt with the acrylic finish. 
Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this time, but I would recommend your support. So, uh, why do you think the usage is so much higher for tennis at Kiwanis than at that, I tennis? think the, the major reason is the Williamsburg Parks and Rec operates the majority of the tennis programs. We don't try to duplicate a lot of our services, even though we know that the majority of the participants in their, in their tennis clinics and camps and most of the lessons take place over there. So I think that's been the hub for tennis in James City County, even before we converted one of our courts, uh, you know, because it's centrally located. It's, it is lit, just like Veterans Park. So, uh, and there's seven courts there versus right now we have two tennis uh, at Veterans and two pickleball. You also have public courts on our high schools that aren't lit, and so the community also uses those in James City County after school time and on weekends when they're not being used by the schools. So we do have other public tennis courts. They're just not lit. And one of the things we talked about as if pickleball continues to grow and these eight courts don't meet the demand, then my first recommendation, we come back and we would look at lighting the tennis courts at the high school and dual line them. Uh, we do have that going on right now at Jamestown High School. We put pickleball court lines on the tennis courts so you can play tennis and pickleball there. Is the rec center dual lined? We do not have tennis courts. Oh, no, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, inside for pickleball. Oh, yes, okay. we, do have, we do have the indoor courts. Uh, it's just tough because of the usage of the indoor gymnasium to I'm... take time for that. So you hear from you've got the buy-in of the tennis people that play tennis a lot but the occasional pickup tennis person that comes over to veterans park to play tennis is probably not aware that this is about to happen yeah and one they? of the things that we'll do during the process is we'll make sure we communicate that out well to everybody and have signage over there that public tennis courts lighted public tennis courts are available at Kiwanis and give them if they're not familiar with it we can tell you that just from observation the majority of the use even on the two tennis courts uh, that are dual line now have been pickleball over the last 18 months probably or if not longer they still do get tennis players, uh, but uh, that's just from our observation and staff being out there. Uh, no, I think this is the most cost-effective solution for the immediate future. Yeah. Um, Ten years from now or five, you know, we've gotten 36 years out of those courts. I think it's, it's done its job, uh, but I do think it's time to renovate and replace, and I think this will work for the near future. I don't know if you get a chance to go out there and, and watch them play pickleball. Pickleball, they'll they'll invite you if you want to play. They, you can jump right in. Um, but it's a it's a tight knit group that that really gets in there and they they root each other around and and it can be cold and rainy and you see them out there they're they're going at it. So it's fun to watch and figure out what the you know I've stopped in a couple times you know and um, checked the course out and what they're doing and. And because, you know, the last couple of years they've come to us and said, hey, we'd like to expand. And, and um, I think it's a good, you know, share program where, you know, Williamsburg's doing more of the tennis. We've got other tennis facilities, but, you know, adding to the pickleball because that's really growing. And we've got a lot of people that really enjoy that game. It's neat to watch, too. It's, it's like a shorter type of a tennis match. My guess is we're going to be looking at uh, – more facilities for both before too long because uh, it, it does seem that uh, there's a growing demand for the pickleball and there's also, it seems to me, just watching some of the international tennis matches this summer, um, there is going to be um, a lot of interest uh, among younger people in getting back into tennis again. And I think that's what I heard loudly at, when, when I showed up at that meeting in Williamsburg. By far the majority were tennis players and they say, yeah, we understand the growth in pickleball. It may be the fastest growing community or sport right now in the nation, but we got high school tennis players. We got other things, you know, we support pickleball, but don't take our courts. And now we will have seven lighted tennis courts and eight lighted pickleball courts, not including the tennis courts that are already present at the high school, which would give you another 12, 14, I believe. So, Still have we still will have significantly more tennis courts in the community than we will pickle. Right. 
Further questions? Okay. I'm looking for a motion. Look for a motion. Motion for approval. Okay, Ms. Colorado. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, next is Z919-0011, Mason Park Proffer Amendment. Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors. Mr. Jonathan Kramer of H.H. Hunt Homes has submitted a request to amend proffers for Mason Park adopted in 2006. The applicant is proposing to delete reference to detached garages from the adopted proffers to allow the construction of residential units with attached garages. In 2006, the 9.11 acre property located at 1916 Jamestown Road was rezoned from R8, Rural Residential District, to R2, General Residential, with proffers, along with a special use permit for a cluster overlay and a request for a reduced street width. Mason Park was approved as a residential development with 15 single-family detached units with detached garages and a gross density of 1.65 dwelling units per acre. According to the applicant, the proposed amendment reflects a preference in the current housing market for residential units with detached garages. No further changes are requested by the applicant. Staff does not anticipate additional impacts to be generated by this proffer amendment. The comprehensive plan designates this property as low density residential and establishes residential land use standards, which among other elements encourage locating garages at the rear or side of the dwelling units in order to de-emphasize the the, the prominence of the garage and associated driveway. With the proposed garage, the, with, excuse me, with the proposed change, the garages would no longer be detached structures, but they would still be consistent with this language by being located at the rear of the dwellings. The adopted master plan for this proposal also placed garages at the rear of the dwelling units. Staff finds the proposal to be compatible with surrounding development and consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. On September 4, 2019, the Planning Commission recommended approval of this application by a vote of 7-0. Staff recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this application and accept it, uh, acceptance of the amended proffers. This time, we'll be happy to answer any questions. The applicant is also in attendance. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Romero? Yeah, I, I've got a few. Um, um, so, uh, as, I've, as I've looked through some of the material, both for this request and the original. Um, I noticed that uh, we had a rezoning and an SUP in this case. And the SUP, of course, had a um, requirement that uh, there be a commencement of construction within uh, three years or it would expire. And in talking to the county attorney, I, I understand that uh, the General Assembly passed legislation that basically said because of the housing crisis, um, those, sun, th those um, deadlines were extended and would continue. I guess what, what I'd like to know is what would constitute the beginning of construction and what would be our expectations that construction would continue beyond doing something just to take the clock, to, to stop the clock? Um, so, what would constitute the construction, right. st the start of construction uh, would be, let's see. So, would, would for instance, um, the um, uh, plans for um, uh, the site uh, have to be approved? Would uh, plans for the construction of, uh, of the homes be required at that point? Um, sure. So, the construction plans for this, for this project actually has already been approved. Right, although they're changing now since, to some degree, right? Right. right. But we could potentially just make, uh, the applicant could amend uh, the, the plan just to show the, the correct location or the revised location of the garages. Okay. okay. Um, so that's, but that is not construction, right? Correct, it's not. Um, uh, it doesn't appear that there is a um, specifically on the proffers, uh, what okay. constitute to be construction, but typically we understand construction by um, um, uh, starting a land disturbing permit application and having uh, um, uh, permits for our foundations. Um, and has that, have any of those been issued? I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I believe the land disturbing permit has been um, issued, but I 
I don't know what other kind of permits have been um, have been uh, re requested. Yeah, um, I, I, and I'm asking this. You know, uh, you know. Obviously, the, we have a case in front of us, but I'm also kind of curious as to how this operates. We just uh, had discussions about uh, uh, properties where um, you know construction starts and then just kind of stays in limbo for decades. Um, and I, you know, I just wonder what the point of having a three-year expiration date is if it's never really going to be triggered. Um, so uh, that's that's uh, uh, something of an issue. I also also found, um, as I read through it, it seemed to, there was a, a certain amount of vagueness to things. So, for instance, um, it talks about um, environmental uh, considerations and talks about things like that uh, the um, uh, paving to the garage. Um, would include could include um, grass strip between the two lanes that would bring the cars back to the garage area with sure. grass, uh, but it does. I didn't get the sense that it required that, just that that or things like it. And I'm sort of qu kind of curious as to how we determine what's what's actually required by these proffers. Um, that is correct. That is um, under proffer number nine, environmental protections. Okay. And it says, um, including additional bioretention facilities and other low impact design features generally as shown in the master plan, which include without limitation, uh, dry soils, uh, poros, pavement and driveway parking areas, and at least one rain barrel per unit. And other design features such as um, use of grass strips in driveways to reduce impervious cover consistent with the goals of the Powhatan Creek Watershed Management Plan. Um, so this is the original language, and my understanding of the language is that um, items such as this or similar would be, uh, would, uh, would be uh, permitted and allowed. Items such as this would be permitted but not required? Um, I don't think that the, the, the proper language it specifically says required. And so as I, as I read through the, the materials, again, again from the 2006 case, um, it talked a lot about affordability uh, of, of the housing stock. And I didn't see anything that really spoke to that in the proffers. Um, was that anything that, that um, we thought about asking to be included more specifically um, in, uh, in this particular application? So no, recall, knowing that we now have a, a you know an affordable housing policy that would actually have some expectations. Uh, correct. Right at the time in 2006, um, um, uh, there was no hop, right. um, and I remember having conversation about um, uh, affordability, uh, uh, housing affor affordability, but it's not um, the type of product that the applicant is proposing. Um, and this, with this um, amendment, this is not something that we've uh, approached or discussed with the applicant. Right. Although, although we don't, uh, you know, um, we have in, in that uh, housing opportunity policy, we have an option for um, the developer who doesn't want to have a, um, a mix of housing costs to make a payment in lieu of. Correct. Right. So. There, there are ways to address that. And, th and that really gets me to, to sort of one other aspect of this, which is, um, you know, as I looked at uh, the requirements again, they, they still call for utilization of what are now probably outdated um, green building standards. Um, and there's no effort to update that, is that right? Um, um, we've, when we uh, talked to the, to the applicant, um, We've requested that, in addition to what well, we, we discussed, in addition to um, the garages, if, if there's any other updates um, to the proposal, and there was none. Right. And but uh, wouldn't yeah okay. Uh, that, that, so there's a policy issue here about whether whether we should want to, uh, if if we're reopening a situation like this, whether we want to bring the standards up to date. Thank you. That's. I, I have. A, I'll. I'll Probably ask the applicant a question or two. Any questions for staff? All right. Um. Sure. Ooh, can I interject real quick? <laughs> we pulled up the uh, previous SUP. Um, 
2006. From 2006, and it, uh, the condition reads, if construction is not commenced on this project within 36 months from January 1, 2008, the SUP shall become void. Construction shall be defined as obtaining permits for building construction and footings and or foundation that have passed required inspections. Has that happened? So that hasn't happened yet. So what that will have to do is because of the continued extensions of that language within state code, the new expiration date for the subdivision construction plans, which have already been approved by county staff, and the new expiration date for the special use permit is now July 1st, 2020. So all that's gonna to have to happen by then. All this is for the for the housing crisis of the late uh, 2000s. Of 09, yeah, yes right, sir. Right. There were subsequent we're extensions of that in state code. I think that, and that I, particular I guess, crisis is over. I guess my question would be then is if this extends resets that and extends it for 36 months to 20. Uh, it doesn't, Mr. Chairman. That's the, the only reason that this is still around is because the state code has saved it. Okay. And so uh, our time would have expired because they haven't gotten those permits. Our time would have expired uh, within 36 months from January 1, 2008. The General Assembly stepped in before it expired and basically extended it, and they continue to extend it about every two years. Okay. And so... It'll come before this General Assembly, again, this 2020 General Assembly, to see whether or not they extend it beyond July 1, 2020. So if, if they, they do not. If they, if they continue to extend it, then having anything in there really is meaningless. That's correct. Okay. So again, that three-year clock, Mr. Eisenhower, doesn't start on July 1, 2020. Commencement of construction as defined in this SUP condition from 06 has to have been met by 2020 or the SUP will expire. And also there was a, a to follow up on another earlier question, a land disturbance permit has also already been pulled and the surety is already in place. So the next steps, uh, should the developer want to right. pursue this and not amend the subdivision construction plans that were approved, I think back in 09, 08, 09, unless they don't change that, their next steps would be just to come in and pull a building permit. So, Chairman, one, one final clarification while we're doing that. Um, Mr. McLennan asked a series of questions about whether or not we could update this particular policy or that particular policy contained within um, the applicant's previous materials. Of course, what's submitted to the board is, is the priority of the, of the applicant. The board right. can't go in there and say, change these things. Of course, the applicant can do that if the applicant desires. That's right. No, I understand that. Okay. But I, I guess the question would be whether we would want to just sort of, um, in looking at the existing proffers, suggest to the applicant that there are some ways in which um, we feel that uh, we need to be meeting uh, contemporary standards um, after a, a, uh, an approval that was granted 13 years ago. Certainly within the board's right, ability. Right. And I, um, so I guess, is, uh, since this isn't a public hearing, so we're not gonna open any kind of public hearing, um, maybe I'll ask the applicant uh, to, to answer a question, which is basically, um, uh, is it still the intention of the applicant to actually carry out this project, or is it uh, um, uh, the case that uh, this um, property may be on the market, may be uh, sold to somebody else to carry out this uh, project? Good evening. Um, it's definitely indeed our... Uh, would, you, would you mind just uh, introducing yeah, yourself? Sure. I'm sorry. My name is John Kramer with H.H. Sure. Fun Homes. Thanks. Um, this has obviously been a project on our books for a long time. But as of right now, this is a major priority for me to get this project off the ground and get moving. I'd like to start these homes very soon. And with the new design, this is something that my next step is initiated to go into the planning um, department, give them the new plans with the attached garages to have those approved, and then start the uh, groundworks and get this project moving. 15 houses this is something that my company will not sit around for that long it's 15 houses and we would love to get these going and get this neighborhood done it's a beautiful neighborhood as planned right it, it uh and, and i think that's what what was attractive and uh, um initially in, in looking at the proposal was that uh, um you know uh there um were uh, representations made of, of uh, a quality um, development by a quality builder and I just um, I guess I'm a little concerned that here we are 13 years later um, the company hasn't moved ahead with this particular project 
uh, that uh, we, we have certainly seen plenty of instances in which um, uh, there have been, um, there's been some flexibility in terms of, well, what's it actually going to be like? Uh, uh, and then a quality builder finds that they don't have the resources or uh, the time to actually carry it out and have turned it over to another developer um, who may not have the same um, vision of what that community might look like. And so I guess I'm just wondering whether it wouldn't be useful to have a little bit more specificity in the, in the proffers that are uh, attached to this particular development because of the fact that uh, um, uh, there is this kind of looseness and a lot of time has passed. We've looked through the design of this. Obviously, it's been out there for a long time. But with the design previously done, the lead requirements were actually above and beyond its time back then, and they probably meet or exceed really the needs of today's standard. That's why it's one of the things that we chose not to change in the plans. Uh, currently, it's still a great design. And, and as, as the project is built, um, what mechanism is there to enforce those lead requirements? Um, they're in the construction documents, and we follow the construction documents. Right, but would there be, is there anything in our um, uh, approval that would require that those be met? But where is, the, what is the proper requirement precisely on environmental? Isn't it, isn't it that we follow like 2006? Um, guidance in buildings. I mean, yes, that's the proffer that's in there. Yeah. And then right. as, as that building permit comes in for building permit review, staff would make sure that what has been submitted is at least meets equal that to 2006 green building requirement, correct. but not exceed uh, lead requirements, right? Correct. Right. That's, that's, see, that's the concern I have is that you, uh, you know, I, I can certainly, you know, look at you and say, well, that's your intention, um, but where's our enforcement? We're talking about the driveways most of all, the driveways and the rain barrels. So the rain barrels, that's definitely something we intend to put in, and the driveways. Right. And it all comes down to the impervious yeah. area of those yeah. lots right. that we choose to, I mean, it's, or in the construction documents, there's no reason to go away from that design. Right. Again, you know, I'm not disputing your intention to do that, mm -hmm. um, but but my responsibility is to make sure that whoever carries out this project um, is held to a standard that we are able to enforce. You know, we would, you know, I've done a lot of work in James City County mm -hmm. over the past year. Probably yeah. built hundreds of homes. And we have always met every standard that is required of us. And this is one of those that we would, it's a beautiful planned neighborhood. And we, right. and that's and, why. And thank you, thank you for that. I just, I, I think it, again, this is just me. And I, under, I understand the other board members may have differing perspectives. But um, um, my sense is that, uh, you know, I can have a lot of confidence in what you would do if, mm -hmm. if you were doing it, but I also have to take into account the possibility you might not ultimately be doing this project. And then I have, would have to ask, so will those sta same standards be met? And if we don't have the enforcement ability, then I, I don't know how we do that. Well, they're gonna, they're gonna be met if, um, if it's turned in and that's part of the plan then our staff's gonna make sure that it's gonna make, Our staff's gonna make sure that it meets the proffer, and the proffer says 2006 green building standards. Right. Right, but. Not uh, much has changed, but, I mean. But, little... but, but Mr. Hunt, uh, uh, but, but H.H. Hunt is saying basically that um, they are gonna meet a higher standard. That would be better then. It would be better, but if, if uh, they don't, we don't have any enforcement of that. Well, we would to the 2006. Yes. So that's we're exactly better right. off than a house that doesn't have anything. Sure. We're still moving forward. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah. if they had wanted to stick with the plan the way it was, would they have had 
to come back here at all at this time? No, uh, no. And so then we wouldn't have Right, it. yeah. Sure. Right. Um, but there's been some, there was some work done there because I watched the dirt being cleared. There was some, looks like some piping long ago that was there. There's some ground works there currently. Okay, and you intend to use those same? Right, we'll do works. a survey to make sure that since some time it's been passed that all the ground works still in place and we'll put scopes in there and make sure everything's still good. I mean, we intend to move fast on this project and get this going. This is, for us, like I said, a major priority to get this going. Um, thank, thank you. I, I had a more question for staff. So when someone comes back like this from that time, there doesn't have to be any impact on schools or anything like, and I realize this is, this is 15 houses, but still it could be 1.5. So you don't have to review those types of of impacts on public staff is is limited in reviewing the application that's given to them. So in this particular case, uh, the change was for Couched. the, the uh, garage location. So that's what staff is Reviewed. limited to judging its impact. Not the whole thing. Not the whole thing. Correct. So if they came in and had a different proffer and they said, uh, you know, we want to add one house then we would regard that house under perhaps the newer standards. Okay, so it's not, I'm not, I mean, it's, this is not directed at you, but wow, because there's probably a lot out there that's been sitting that we have no idea what's ahead. It's a little, that's a little frightening because this, H.H. H. Hunt, really, if they could have said, well, we're just going to stick with the detached garages, they would have built 15 houses and everybody would have been screaming at us that we approved new houses. But these houses were approved back in 2006. And so we have valid. no, yeah. we're not, I mean, the only thing we're saying is you have to attach a garage. Yeah. Or we're approving attaching a garage. Okay. Thank you. Any other Questions for staff. All right, we do have planning commissioner for this one, so we'll have uh, Ms. Dowdy come forward. Are there any questions for me, particularly? That was a, a lot of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, you know, just sticking to the attached to garage, that was our focus. Um, those were great comments, great feedback, um, but we were all in support of, you know, making that change. Thank you. All righty. So, any other questions for other staff or any? Uh... Uh, um, Mr. Chair, here, I, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just say what I, what I think. Um, uh, I think that uh, ultimately I could support this proposal, but but it would be after there was some recognition of the need to tighten up some of the expectations. Um, I, as much as as um, you know, I uh, would like to to say that there's no question of who's going to build this particular project, and there's no question that they would meet all the kind of soft expectations that are included in the proffers. Um, uh, I've seen too many instances in which shortly after uh, a, a change has been made or a, a rezoning has been approved uh, that there has been a change in ownership. And uh, the, the responsibility that I feel I've got is to say, well, um, let's make sure that, what, that the vision that was presented to us um, has some teeth behind it. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there Again, a couple of places where it would be helpful uh, to have a clarification of language uh, in the proffers about what is actually uh, being offered um, uh, and uh, an ability to say, this is what we are holding you to. Uh, I don't think that's present in the environmental area as much as I would like to see. Uh, and uh, uh, that, uh, uh, in particular is an area that I'd be concerned about, but I, I do think that uh, there's an opportunity here for us to just sort of lock in 
um, some some changes. I could I'd have to disagree. Um, I could see if we were changing the number of lots and adding a house or something like that, then we're re redoing the the um, entire neighborhood. Um, but with changing a detached to attached garage, it's still the same amount. It's not, you know, changing the whole look of the neighborhood. I would think if the company was, you know, you always worry about if a company sells something or not, but that's not our job. Our job is to, you know, as, as John was saying, put things in place um, prior to that. But having this land and having this in their books this long, I don't think tomorrow they're going to sell the place. I wouldn't think so, and I would think I would take you at your word that y'all are going to build this project. And um, that's all I can do is take a person at their word. And, um, you know, when they come before us and say, we're going to do this, then, you know, I can't, you know, second guess, maybe they will, maybe they won't. I've got to take them for what they're telling me they're going to do. Um, you know, I think our, our subject matter here is attached or detached garage, change in plan and that. We're not adding or subtracting or changing and adding homes and, and that sort of thing and changing the master plan. Um, it was a good plan when it was approved by, you know, another board um, in 2006, I think it was. And um, it worked well, and it was a um, neighborhood that was going to be um, something that, you know, was a higher quality than some of the other neighborhoods we were having at that time. So um, I don't think that's going to change. I don't think the company has has changed their route and the houses they built in James City County and have gone since 2006 and started building junk. So they built high-quality stuff for us. So, you know, I would, I would um, assume they're going to continue to do this, and that's all we can do you know, as a board is to take somebody who comes in front of us at their word and is truthful and, and they're an honest person and they're going to uphold that. So I'd be in support of it. I would just like to add also, if I may, um, that I, I do agree with what Mr. Hippel was saying, that we're here to, to make a decision about the, the garages and, you know, we've, we've, talked about some of these properties that have been sitting for all these years well now they're finally going to do something with it so I commend you for that and um, I would also be in support of this process because I, I think to Ms. Uh, Larson's point it were it not for a garage we weren't we wouldn't be here talking about it so with that I, I would be in support of the project as well I'll just add that I I am concerned about, and I hope that did come across, that I am concerned about some of the things I, that we have on the books, and I don't know how we go about getting that information or if planning is in conversation with some things that might be coming back forward like this so that we could be made aware. Uh, that would be great. So, um, I would... Uh I remember this one quite well. Um, I don't. I think I can say with some certainty that John and I voted against this one. No, I actually voted for it. You did? Okay. <laughs> I, I remember I voted. Yeah, you against voted against it. it. I voted yes. against it. Yeah. Uh, there were some some concerns uh, that I had. Uh, environmental being one of them, density for the uh, uh, and traffic, you know, being being where it was. Um, but that being said, that was a decision the board made. John's point <clears throat> that he brings up, which is really over and above what we're considering here this evening, but it's something that we need to consider going forward, is we have had repeated, repeated things when we, we make a decision, and then the decision we make goes with that piece of property forever, but it doesn't come to fruition for 10, 15, 20 years, and then somewhere down the line, some of the decisions that we made that went into that decision are terribly outdated by the time it gets done. And so the impacts are grossly out of proportion with what we anticipated when we approved it. So what that means is that the monkey is back on our back when we do these approvals to be very forward looking. And it would be nice if the General Assembly gave us some authority to say there's a, some time frames uh, or some ability to update some of these things as we go forward. Uh, we don't seem to be getting a whole lot of that from them. Um, but um, as far as this one is concerned, it's just strictly an issue of detached or de uh, detached garages. Um, 
you know, I'll support the change. Uh, I guess if we get it built and we get quality homes, um, then that's one more off the books. But I think next month we're going to see another one again like that coming back. So we're going to see these things time and time again. Going forward, we really need to think very long and hard about any approvals we do and how we can construct things to guard against this kind of a, of a problem in the future. Um, any, I'll look for a motion. Motion for approval. We have a motion for approval. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Mr. McLennan? No. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Mr. Eisenhower, I'm going to have to take a two second break. Okay. Hey, yeah. Let's take a, about a three minute break. Yeah, I'll give you a little more time. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a three minute break.
the meeting back to order. We now have uh, our third board consideration, initiation of abandonment of a portion of Jolly Pond Road. Mr. Kesman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, previously, the board indicated its desire to initiate the abandonment of Jolly Pond Road near the Jolly Pond Dam. Adoption of the attached resolution will begin that process. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for staff? Just uh, if you could take us through that process. Uh, this is just an initiation. There will be opportunities for um, a public hearing. Is that right? Uh, if if there is re there are requests for that? It, it depends upon whether it's requested. So this kicks off uh, a period of, of advertisement, um, both along the roadway and the newspaper, uh, a posting at the courthouse uh, over at least 30 days. Uh, if someone asks for a public hearing, then, then one will be had. And if not, then uh, it's just concluded by the board adopting a resolution either confirming the abandonment or ending the process. And so while, while um, this is initiating the process, it also is sort of um, setting in, in motion a sense that if there are uh, any ideas or thoughts or uh, processes that people want to pursue, this is the time to do it because the clock is now ticking. Yes, sir. And this is just the asphalt portion. It's the top. Yes, sir. The so um, VDOT had, had long ago discontinued that portion of the road that was at the county's request, so the county now owns the, the, the asphalt, however deep that is, and that's it. So canes are here, correct? Did they want to say anything, Mr. Stevens? I saw that you were talking with them. Or okay. They didn't indicate so. Okay. They, but they've been working Aware. through a process and... Yes, ma'am. We've had a lot of him. conversations with the, with the Canes as well as trying to keep them up to date of where we are as well as some of the residents in the Jolly Pond area. And Mr. Kane did, was at our meeting initially when we first discussed this as well. Okay. There was a lot of, there's, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes and, and with the residents and with the Canes and, and the county staff. I appreciate everybody trying to figure out a solution for this issue. It's been a very tough one and um, a very hard one to work through um, because it does put a heartache on the citizens down in that end of Jolly Pond Road for, you know, more travel time to get around there. And and, um, and the dam served us for a long time, and the board before us went ahead and, and um, took that over to lengthen that time, and we got, what, 10, 12 years longer out of the, the road than we thought we would end up with in, in the process. And... and um, now with regulations and dam safety and and ownership and what we own and what they own and everything else it's it's gotten to the point where you know it's uh it's and and the cost the cost is there you know and and i know we've got other projects in the county as well that we need to spend money on that that are life-saving costs that that need to be factoring into it so it's a it's a very tough situation that that we're in um with this and and um but like everything, you're not you're not paid not to make the soft decision, you made make the decision. So on and, and keep things going. I would just offer that um, raise your hand if your aunt and uncle have a sign in their yard to call your local supervisor <laughs> um, over the dam. Um, I'm probably the only one up here that can raise their hand. Um, and they have my phone number, so I don't know why they felt the need to put a sign. But um, <laughs> I realize that, you know, joking aside, there are many people that I know that have been impacted by uh, this this closure, and um, not only family, but, but friends as well, and it's been something that has been really wrestled with, and I do appreciate all the staff time that I know has gone into this um, this entire discussion, I appreciate the Canes' willingness to talk with staff. Uh, I appreciate the passion of the people that live out there. This is a major life change um, that they've had to endure the additional time on the to go only the other side of the road. Um, I I am a tad frustrated because I don't really know what the plan was last time it was opened. And so I do feel that part of the reason that people are upset is because I think when it was opened initially, there was a sense that it's opened and that you're going to be able to continue to use this. And I don't know that they understood that, you know, it was only pavement 
and pavement wasn't going to last forever and there was going to be additional repairs that were needed and so I understand that frustration that is that is coming from this so I you know I do think that um, they probably in all likelihood thought that once it was reopened it was reopened and and there was nothing else going to be said about it so I guess I would only hope moving forward that when if we ever are faced with anything like this again that that we have a plan that we know exactly what is going to happen if we if we do you know now I realize things things come up but if we open something before it's really ready to be opened then you know this is how we plan to address it uh, you know in my own neighborhood there is a dam and the county administrator and VDOT came out, met with us, and told us under <laughs> no uncertain terms, it's privately owned by your HOA. VDOT had the documents back to the 1960s to show that it was um, a privately held dam. So, and, you know, I have an intersection, I have two in, in my district that are causing me great concern right now, and that is widely traveled, and need money for some improvements so um, it's very difficult to put public money into something that is private when you know that public money is needed some places where the public are able to use it so At that point Ms. Larson I would, I would need to agree that with it being a private um, situation and the need is out there for pub for funding for other important locations that's widely traveled as I mentioned earlier this evening in front of Stonehouse Elementary, we've got accidents happening out there repeatedly, and it's a very dangerous situation. So, you know, we, we have to weigh things out to uh, prioritize where funding is coming from and how we spend our funds. And um, so that, that's one of the main concerns that I've had about this, is being able to take care of the needs that we have that take care of a, safety issues for a lot of people. Um, so with you know it's it, it's difficult, but that's that's where my, um, my where my frustration has been and uh, where my priorities need to be tonight. I'm, I'll I'll just say that uh, uh, again um, uh, I'm happy to hear any ideas or thoughts for uh, some kind of solution to to the problem uh, it's really painful to see a piece of infrastructure go away when it's still being utilized by citizens and so uh, if if there were a way to address it um, at a reasonable cost to those involved that would be wonderful I haven't seen that yet um, so I have anything to forward on so discussion I look for a motion and it's in my district and all that uh, you know and, and nobody wants to make this motion and I don't blame him one bit um, we'd like to keep it open and like to keep it moving moving forward but decisions need to be made and we need to keep moving forward as well so I make a motion to uh, start the process okay Mr. Stevens call the roll Mr. McGlennon aye Ms. Sadler aye Ms. Larson aye Mr. Hipple aye Mr. Eisenhower aye motion carries okay all right, we are down to the fourth one, which is amend um, adopted meeting calendar to add a joint CIP meeting with Williamsburg, James City County Schools, and the City of Williamsburg on December 3rd, 2019 at 9 a.m. at Legacy Hall. And while we're at it, I wanted to ask the question, uh, how does the comp plan town hall fit in? Is that considered a meeting that has to be amended on our calendar as well, or is that one where we're actually doing it independently or a November 18th meeting yeah, November 18th so currently we're not planning to have all of you all in one room we want to have five different locations okay. in each of your separate districts so, so I'll that would not require to Adam for the final call but uh, okay all right you're, you're separate you're okay I just want to make sure we, we had that clarified okay so I'm looking for a motion to amend the calendar as I motion, motion. Stevens. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Rice? Aye. Motion carries. I do have a request. I, I wondered if there was any way that we could get, I, 
as part of our regular meeting, and we're going to meet with the school board the first Tuesday of December in a joint. And I realize things come up, and we may have to adjust that meeting, but if we get it on our calendar, at least we're not doing because I, I had the fifth, and then all of a sudden we got a thing come, you know, that came back. Oh, we're gonna we're gonna repoll everybody, and now it's the third. So um, if there was a way to get some of these that, that we know are going to happen, get them on at the beginning, and then um, change if necessary. But we'll try to do that for next. Yeah, year. that'd be good, great. Good idea. Um, December 3rd, okay, good. All right, we are down to board requests and directives. All right, I'll um, start them off. Um, this this month had HR TAC budget meeting, and on the 12th, on the 17th, I was honored to, to talk to the Plantation Club on transportation, and uh, what a good group that is, and enjoyed talking to the um the group there as well and let them know where transportation stands and where how, how much forward we have moved not only james city county but as a region september 19th at hr tac tpo and pdc meetings um the 30th the powhatan ferry boat and i'm sorry y'all didn't get the the um note on that i got one but i don't know why the rest of you didn't and uh, but i've got you each a uh, yes, you did. Yeah, uh, the rest of them didn't get it. Only you and I got it. I, I, I don't know what happened there, and, and I apologize if if um, somewhere down the line that y'all didn't get that. But y'all should have gotten that invitation from VDOT. I do have a um, um, coming to us the coins. I picked a coin up for everyone, a county county administrator, assistant county administrator, and uh, and Adam as well, the county attorney, so that each one of us would have a commemorative coin. So we've got that for that. Um, Let's see. Also today is Michael Jr.'s birthday. I'm going to take a little liberty and, <laughs> and wishing him a happy birthday. And on the 10th is Samuel's birthday. So happy right birthday. behind his is, is Samuel. So got two at the same week. So Thank Let me you. just say that Samuel has a very nice birthday twin on the 10th. <laughs> oh, you're the oh, yes. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we're very close in age. <laughs> very. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute. I, I, I might have mentioned this. If, I, if I'm double mentioning, I'm sorry. But uh, Supervisor McGlennon and I went down and did um, the uh, food bank uh, on local officials volunteer day. And I talked about the fact that we had packed backpacks, I think. But I got a card from them. And so I wanted to let, us, let our citizens know that they are supplying 230 backpack bags per week to children at seven elementary schools in WJCC this year, which is definitely um, a growth. And so that's something that, that we all need to be cognizant of. And um, along that same line, I, I know that a local organization, House of Mercy, was putting out a plea that their um, shelves were bare and I had um, someone had sent me something about the, the holidays and, a, and an advent calendar where instead of getting a piece of candy that you bought a food item and donated it to your local food bank. So um, just something for all of us to keep in mind. I also had an opportunity to sit on a panel with um, Supervisor McLennan last week for um, the Williamsburg Area Association of Realtors. It was us and um, Senator Mason, Senator Normitt, Delegate Pogge. And so um, thank them for that opportunity. And Walt Zaremba. Walt Zaremba, yes, thank from you. From York County. Gosh. And um, they also you read- You had my letter. They, they also read a letter from Ms. Sadler, yes. Um, so thank them for having us. And I, um, on Friday, went with Mr. Stevens and several members of Stormwater. Were, were other departments rep? I think everybody was Stormwater, right? Uh, there were how many of us total? F six, five, five, or, yes. We went out with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and did the James River cruise, which was so educational. I'm so glad. Didn't Did you send something um, saying? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm so glad that I went. I'm so glad that staff went. Uh, there were people um, from Virginia Beach, uh, Hampton, Norfolk, 
uh, York, and I'm sure I'm missing somebody, but it was so educational and really just, um, it, it really got you just proud of all the work that we are doing to ensure that we have clean water here, and it's, it's so very important. So if you haven't had a chance to go, please try to go. I uh, also want to thank Laurel Lane, third grade. Their third grade had me out to, to, to talk about um, during their civics unit. And um, Jenny Pritchett was the teacher that asked me to come out. And that was, they were so engaging. The kids were great. And one of them recognized me in the grocery store, just like what happened <laughs> to Supervisor <laughs> Lennon, and introduced me to his mom and his sister. And mm -hmm. that was Brian. I just want to say thanks a lot. And he knew so much and that he had remembered. And I was just really impressed by that. And the question I have for you, Mr. Kinsman, is that I've gotten a couple of calls. The neighborhood deer population seems to be even more than last year, if possible. And I know that when this had come up before about a neighborhood in my district, it, when it came to shooting, um, a controlled hunt, I guess is a better way to put it, um, that is actually something that is done, it needs to be worked through the police department. Police and uh, DGIF. Okay. They do the controlled hunts. Okay, period. Bow hunting as well? Not bow hunting. We don't regulate bow hunting in, in James City County. So you, you could do it. I mean, you have, to be, um, you have to be reasonable with what you do. You can't be shooting bows across people's property, but we don't have a, a specific regulation to bow hunting. Uh, in James City County, we have an early season, which actually is already over with. That was September was the early bow season, and I think you're, now you're just into regular bow season. Yep, you are. So you don't, do you have to notify your neighbor on either side that you're going to be bow hunting, or? No, ma'am. You just can go out in your yard and, and bow hunt? Yes, ma'am, with caution. Okay, okay. So, okay, I appreciate the information. Can, can I just put a plug in? Uh, our podcast in two weeks, within two weeks, is going to be on the uh, topic of hunting uh, and the various regulations you need. So please keep an eye on our website because we have a member of DGIF and county staff that's participated in that. So it should be very informational. So it's already been done? It's already been recorded, but it hasn't been posted. It'll be posted within two weeks. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank Ur you. Urban archery season's in now and it goes all the way through March. So that allows more hunting into urban areas. Okay. Thank you so much. I love, let me be clear. I, I love deer, but um, I do get a lot of questions and they, they are taking over. So thanks. Good. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, I'll be very brief. Just a couple of upcoming events up our end of the county on um, Saturday the 12th from three to seven. We have this fish fry at station one. We'd love for everyone to come out and participate and Enjoy some great fish. They do a really good job over there. And then on the 26th um, is Chickahominy Days down on Chickahominy Road. We always have a great parade, and it's a lot of fun, a lot of booths and all kinds of games and stuff for the day. So it's a great fall day there as well. So just a couple plugs for the Sternhouse District. That's it. Thanks for giving me that extra time, Sue. Appreciate it. You're quite welcome. <laughs> I wanted to uh, first mention that I had the uh, honor of representing the board uh, at Thomas Nelson Community College's 10th anniversary of their historic Triangle Campus. Uh, they, they combined that with a, um, a performing arts uh, and visual arts presentation, which was just uh, outstanding. Got to see uh, many of those community college students who were uh, interested in drama, musical theater, uh, uh, ballroom dancing, uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, uh, ways in which they were expressing their artistic talents. And we are so fortunate to have that campus up, the community college here in our community. Uh, secondly, wanted to uh, also uh, mention that I earlier this evening passed out to everybody a challenge coin from the National Parks Conservation Association. This is an appreciation for our involvement in the efforts to prevent the uh, power lines from going above the James River. Uh, in, in regard to that, wanted to make sure the citizens knew that next Tuesday, uh, uh, Judge uh, Royce Lambert of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia will be holding a hearing on remediation. 
Uh, he, he was part of a panel of judges that ruled earlier that uh, the Army Corps of Engineers violated uh, the um, requirements of the law in issuing a permit to uh, Dominion Energy uh, for the uh, construction of those power lines, and he is now taking testimony on how people would suggest that that uh, uh, case, uh, that that uh, violation be remediated. So that I'm sure there will be a lot of people uh, anxiously following what happens next Tuesday in Washington. Uh, I would also uh, move on to a couple of uh, uh, quick items of business. Um, uh, we uh, are, um, the board members are going to the Virginia Association of Counties uh, uh, annual meeting at the Homestead, and part of that requires that we designate a voting member from our locality. And since Mr. Eisenhower is going to be there and is chairing the board this year, I'd move that uh, Mr. Eisenhower be our voting uh, representative at the Bay Cove meeting. Four to one against. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we have to designate an alternate as well. Uh, okay, who who else is going to be there on Tuesday? Vice chair. I won't be there on Tuesday. Anybody else? Want to oh, do Mr. That? Hipple, the vice Hipple. chair, will he be there on Tuesday? Tuesday morning. I come back Monday night. <laughs> it will be Ms. Larson. Then. <laughs> Ms. Larson. So Ms. Larson. Ms. Larson. So, All right. Okay. So I would move that we uh, appoint uh, Mr. Eisenhower as the voting delegate and uh, Ms. Larson as the alternate. Aye. 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 Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Maybe give it time to call the roll. Uh, secondly, um, I've, I've had some discussions with uh, Mr. Kinsman about the issue of vaping. Um, this is obviously a source of great concern right now. We've seen a number of deaths, including one now in Virginia and thousands of, uh, of uh, injuries uh, to uh, people's lungs, both young people and, and older people. But uh, uh, I would like to get, and, and I was pleased to hear from uh, Mr. Kinsman today that he already is working on this issue, uh, and, his, uh, and uh, um, uh, Liz Parman as well, uh, to look at questions about what authority we might have to regulate the placement of, uh, of, inst of establishments that uh, sell vaping um, supplies in re uh, relation to their to nearness of schools, for instance, or whether we have ways in, in which we might prohibit uh, such uh, establishments in uh, various zoning districts where they might currently be permitted. Uh, so hopefully we'll get something about that as time goes on. And then finally, um, and I know you're happy to hear that word, Bless you. finally, um, uh, in the discussion that we had earlier about underground utilities, it struck me that um, uh, we have had a, um, a policy in the past, and we have had reference to it in multiple comprehensive plans, and that it probably makes, it makes sense for us to at least consider the possibility of making a, uh, uh, a fund uh, part of the CIP consideration process, uh, actually um, thinking about the idea of um, dedicating some funding to this, determining where it ranks in, the, in terms of the CIP priorities we have and what we might be able to do, but just so that we're in a position to take advantage of the need to, of the opportunity to bury uh, utility lines. Let's recognize that there are aesthetic ad advantages to it. We make most of our new developments put their utilities underground, but more importantly, uh, there are safety and health issues involved because uh, it could be that people lose their power, and that is critical to their to their life support. Uh, there are convenience issues for our citizens who are um, uh, forced to uh, endure uh, unpleasantness and lose a lot of their um, uh, food and freezers and so forth, uh, or have to make significant investments in, in generators and the like. And uh, just think of all the economic activity that we have to give up because of the fact that uh, significant portions of the community are without power. So uh, it's worth, I think, considering the possibility of uh, um, having a fund in our CIP that is uh, devoted to this particular area so that when opportunities do arise, we're able to act on them. I'd like to comment on that as well. I think it's a good thing that, you know, and I, I think one time we had some. We did half, half yeah, a penny. That's right, mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that, you know, we may want to look at again. Um, and even though I couldn't get Cox down to my house, <laughs> I did, Virginia Power did take the power lines that were at my house and across the creek.
took them all down and buried everything just recently. And they're going to move forward to bury some of the others that, because our area was one area that went down quite often. So they're going to bury some more. Well, while they were doing that, I asked them, I said, hey, can I have the pole out in the middle of the creek? And they said, well, it's not on your property, but we can give it to the owner. So I contacted the owners and asked them if they would accept it, and they said they would. And um, so I went ahead, and I said, I'm going to want to put a um, thing for um, eagles up there. Well, Dominion, unknown to me, they called me back, and they said, look, we have a program that will do that. When we take that down, we'll put up a eagle osprey nest up there on the pole so that we'll, and it's aluminum, so it'll last forever, and we'll install it on this pole. So out in the middle of the creek is this pole that used to be a power line that now is a nest for eagles and ospreys. And Dominion put it all in for free, but I just happened to, you know, think about it and ask them. I said, you know, because we've got a lot of eagles around my area. And um, and they were nice enough that they faced it towards my house, so that made it a little bit sweeter, too. <laughs> and, and are you training those osprey to, to take a cox cable up there rapidly? <laughs> I'm hoping to <laughs> fly down to your house or, or at least an antenna. <laughs> well, uh, I, I will speak. I'm, I'm so happy they did that for you. <laughs> um, because we met with them out at the route, route 5 area where the power goes out all the time. Um, we've been working hard with, because as you all are aware, we have James City County land, we have National Park Service land, we have VDOT, we have a lot of different people involved, and so we've been working on, you know, trying to get the dead trees out of there, to try to um, limb up things. We don't know if maybe when the trail was put in, the trail is beautiful, but we don't know if that disturbs some roots. So that helped, but that the power goes out quite a bit as VDOT themselves um, brought the, the data with that. And it's also very dangerous because when trees go over to take out the power, they're, they're landing on the road. So they, they haven't taken out a motorist yet, but it is of great concern to me that um, that area and the amount of power and, and there's, you know, there's three neighborhoods that get st struck with it all the time. So, yeah, I'm interested in that as well. All right. Uh, and I only have one thing to add, and that was um, I wanted to, I discussed with several of you, but not all of you, uh, and I've, I've had this discussion with uh, um, Mr. Kinsman, uh, and this deals with uh, some of the existing retaining walls. Um, I had a recent case where I had some complaints from folks in Newtown about um, a couple of their BMPs that were built with retaining walls that I did not realize were probably in the vicinity of 35 to 40 feet high. Um, they were built in very close proximity to housing where you have not just people but children, and then they had put um, some fencing along the top, which apparently was broken by plants growing up. It hadn't been maintain maintained or anything, so it became a safety issue. But um, one of the things that I was surprised at is how much difficulty we are encountering um, in some homeowners associations and in some, I think JCSA has one out in uh, Colonial Heritage that's creating a problem for them as well, um, that we have a proliferation of, of many of these, and I gather that the way that the rules are right now, it's an administrative approval. That there's, there's, uh, it, it's basically they want to come in and build one. That's nothing really says what you can do, how high you can build it, or what kind of impacts you have to address. Um, I don't want to, you know, overly regulate, but I do think that I would like to have staff look at some of these problematic um, retaining wall issues that we have, and, and maybe give us a list. I asked if we had an inventory. Apparently we don't, and it would be uh, prohibitive to go through all of them. But I think we can come up with a fairly abbreviated list of the ones that are quite tall and present some significant problems to us, and then have staff come back and present us a list of those, and also to look at potentially some language on how we could um, look for, toward keeping that from occurring in the future. I'll tell you, one of the things that frustrated me in Newtown was it was very clear that the reason they were that high was because they didn't want to give up building space. They built up the space and put the wall in so they could build buildings out to it. I know that when we built uh, approved Founders 
village over on the other side behind uh, near Windsor Mead, the same thing, kind of thing happened. They were going to build retaining walls and build houses right out to them, and we made them back off on that. We had the leverage at that time because it was a, a new uh, development looking for approval. But we may want to consider some sort of, of ordinance that says if it's above a certain height, but within a certain distance of a building or something like that, that, that it then maybe requires the board to, to review or, or something. Um, is there a requirement about the fence? Because I, when this came up with this um, with the citizen in settlement at Powhatan who expressed exactly that about the danger, I di didn't think that there was a requirement that there be a fence, and that was part of the issue. So, it, it might be the difference between a BMP and a retaining wall. Um, BMPs don't don't require fencing and I know a lot the, of the house is right next to yeah, the I know BMP. a lot of I know a lot of BMPs don't don't have fences and, and can I, be pretty steep that's the case in, in Newtown because both of those are BMPs and and they were looking at 35 to 40 feet of, of wall within 15 or 20 feet of, <coughs> of buildings so it, it, it becomes really a safety issue especially in a, in a built up area so I, I if, if, the, if there is consensus on the board to ask staff to look at that and bring some in, I would, I would ask them to maybe provide some information back to us and, and uh, see, see where we, uh, what might be doable and what we might be interested in looking at so we could maybe go forward with that at a later date. But knowing that if there were something that came forward like tonight that was approved back in 2006, we probably can't go back and say you can't do that to the BMP retaining wall, correct? So it would be all new. Approval. Okay. Thank you. I know with with uh, the retaining walls, there's if it's done right, there's lists, and in those lists, they got to be compacted and all that. We may want to reach out to our engineering community and ask some of our engineering companies that that work with you know the contractors around the area. What are the requirements and what are the laws on you know those lists and and compaction and that sort of thing and materials used because sometimes they get put in and they don't have that engineering in them and those are the ones that tend to have the failure rates so it may be something that you know our engineering community out there and the public can give us a hand with and and help us understand the, the um you know engineering behind a, a retaining wall and, and what makes a good retaining wall and allows you know water and everything else to flow through it and not disrupt it and cause a failure there was a failure at the villas at five forks i believe that yeah. was quite quite expensive for that homeowners association it was and they and, and they had they had behind them the um, right away for um service authority so they thought they could build into that it was like ah oh, this is a right away you can't build in that they were they were thinking they were gonna build over top of the certain mm -hmm. i i called and um <clears throat> let doug know i said you know we, we've got an issue here you need to I think that the overriding concern for most of these, in my mind, is uh, number one, safety. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And, and number two is uh, making sure that when we do them, they're done correctly so that they are not a financial burden to a homeowners association that thought they were getting something that was going to last a long time that doesn't. Yes. So, all right. Any other requests or directives? Okay. At that point, we'll have no closed session. Reports to the county administrator. Oh. Chair and members of the board, just a, two items. Uh, one with the upcoming November election. Our director of elections, Mr. Andrew Mormon, asked that I provide some voter information. Uh, just a reminder, the deadline to register to vote in the November general election is Tuesday, October 15th, so that is coming close. The deadline to apply for absentee ballot by mail is Tuesday, October 29th. In-person absentee voting is available Monday through Friday during regular voting registration office hours and Saturday, the October 26th, and Saturday, November 2nd. And then the deadline to vote absentee in person is Saturday, November 2nd. And if uh, citizens have questions about that, her office number 757-259-4949. Again, 259-4949. And then one reminder of an activity up and coming is our <clears throat> Boo Bash at the Beach. It's Saturday, October 19th from 1 to 4. Boo Bash is a family-friendly Halloween event featuring hands-on activities, music, games, food for pur purchase and more. Uh, costumes are welcome. That's for all ages. Children must be accompanied by an adult. The admission fee is $5 per car. Uh, and again, October 19th, 1 to 4 p.m. at Jamestown Beach Event Park. So activities coming and voting coming as well. That's all I have. Okay. 
All right, I will look for a motion to adjourn until 4 p.m. on October 22nd, 2019, for a work session. So moved. Okay. I knew not to get between y'all. Mr. Hipple? <laughs> Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Mr. Isaac? <laughs> the two are going to be right on it. <laughs>